You wrote a thousand words a day for 600 days in a row. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm never someone that's content to go at the same pace as everyone else. Mm. You set the pace, right? Do you want this to take multiple years? Sometimes it should, and sometimes it's best for you. Or do you want to get it done very quickly? That's been probably a defining factor in my life. That's absolutely insane. This week's episode is with Nathan Barry, who's the founder and CEO of ConvertKit, a software company valued at over $100 million. And Nathan's story is absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. He started off working a normal job, realized he didn't particularly enjoy his normal job, taught himself to do design and code type stuff, and started building apps for the iPhone App Store. And then later on, he transitioned away from that to build his software business. I had these three posters on my wall in like my first real home office. And they were the three mantras of create every day, teach everything you know, and work in public. And that was like my equivalent of, of show your work. I guess the way to put it is, it is simple, but not easy. Yep. And so if you get clear with yourself that like, okay, I am setting out to do something that is in fact very difficult and I have to design my day around making sure that this can happen. This has to become my number one priority in my business. Then at that point, you can actually make it happen. Oh, by the way, in case you have not yet heard, my book is about to come out. It's called Feel Good Productivity, How to Do More of What Matters to You. And it's a book that I've been working on for the last three years. Now it's being published at the end of December, 2023, but pre-orders are actually available. And I know people don't like pre-ordering the book, but if you do pre-order the book and you email me your receipt, you will get completely free access to a live exclusive event that I'm hosting in the first weekend of January of 2024. And this is a live online workshop all about annual planning, goal setting, and reflection. And so I'm gonna be facilitating a group with hopefully hundreds of people from all around the world. And we're gonna be going through how to figure out what to do with our life and how to turn that into goals for the year and how to build systems and how to be consistent with stuff and how to make sure that we are enjoying the journey along the way. That is purely exclusively available for people who pre-order the book as a thank you for our little community. So if you want to check it out, you can check out the book. You can maybe consider pre-ordering it. The link will be down in the video description. Nathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you thank for you having so me. so much for coming. This is going to be so much fun. I'm excited. Um, so I'd love to start off with your backstory. Um, how did you come to care about making money? Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in a family where there wasn't a lot of money. Uh, my dad worked in a ministry and uh, everyone you know, supported by donations. And so uh, I actually grew up in a house or like was born in a house up in the, the mountains outside of Boise. And, and uh, you know, it was like a, a tiny house before tiny houses were cool. <laughs> um, now I have a tiny house in my office and it's much cooler than the one that I grew up in. But um, yeah, so I watched like the struggle of money or the lack of money be like kind of a defining factor of childhood. You know, like there was always enough food, but, you know, not much more than that. And so growing up, I watched uh, my parents fight about money. I watched the stress that that caused and then them ultimately divorce. And somewhere along there, I realized like, oh, you can actually make money. I think it was probably, oh, maybe late high school, early college when I first started reading like Jason Fried and DHH from Basecamp. And Jason talked about how making money is a skill mm. and you can get better with it, better at it over time. And that stood out to me because the point that he was making is you wouldn't expect to sit down at the piano and be able to play like some amazing song without practice. And the same way you wouldn't expect or you shouldn't expect to be able to sit down and, you know, start a company in it to do fantastic. And so really it's the combination of not one skill, but like a thousand little skills, just in the same way that music is, right? You, you know, there's music theory and timing and everything else. And, and business is you know, uh, confidence and sales and marketing and pricing and, you know, all the audience building. And so when I understood that, that making money was a skill that you could get better at with practice, then I was like, okay, I'm going to be, you know, the, <laughs> like someone else could be the child prodigy in music. Like that is what I'm going to be absolutely as good as I can at making money. So <clears throat> even hearing you say that, that making money is a skill, it's, and I, I've, I, I noticed myself having a bit of a moment of surprise. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I guess it is. Because I guess it's it's obvious that playing the piano is a skill, but it's not that it's it's weirdly not that obvious that making money is a skill. Well, I think you can't see it, right? I can't sit down. I'm like I'm like Ollie. Let me let me just watch you make money, you know. And it, it it's it's very indirect. I can watch you play the piano, and you, yeah, I could watch you you know do scales or or build up you know these individual things and put it together into a song and and all of that. But um, the skills of making money are a little bit more abstract. And we tend to assign them to things like, um, oh, she's good at sales because she has that natural charisma, 
right? Or, uh, you know, he's just gifted with being a good copywriter. But uh, these are all skills that are learned. And, and sometimes people are better at them than others, right? If you grew up in a family that uh, music was all around you, uh, then you might uh, take more naturally or you might have more of a natural ability towards some of those things in the same way that someone might have more of a natural ability um, towards sales or marketing or some of these th things. But all of them have to be learned. Think about the first time you tried to sell something on the internet, right? Mm. What product, like, how do you do that? When I tried to do it, you know, I'm like, ClickBank, eJunkie, how do you even get money on, yeah. like, from <laughs> a, a person to me? And now there's a lot more tools uh, for it and it's easier, but it's still something that you have to learn, right? Uh, creating a landing page for the first time, that is a skill, right? If you look at the first landing pages that, a lot of content creators make, they're terrible mm -hmm. because they don't understand that the, that the headline should capture attention. But once you know that, you never unlearn it. And so now, you know, years later, if you've been doing this, you're like, I, I don't know, I made a landing page in a half hour. Mm -hmm. And of course it captured attention. Like, it, of course it checked all of these boxes in the same way uh, that, you know, using music as the analogy, right? Like you, your timing is good yeah. because you have learned that. And so I think that's the thing that we miss and, and it's hard as a beginner where you're like, it just, it feels so unknown and there's so many skills. And then someone who's been doing it a long time just sits down and it seems so natural because they have re rehearsed for, in many cases, a decade or several decades. Yeah. No, that's such a good point. I think, so I, I made my first landing page when I was like 13 years old, <laughs> advertising my web design services. We'll put it up on screen if we can find, if I can find that screenshot because I still have it. It's just so funny. Um it was like, you know, want a website for your business or your life? Call this number. And I put my home number on it. It was like, <laughs> made, made up some names, like UIA Web Solutions, like some shitty agency. Yep. Um, but then sort of 15 years later, when, we may, when we're whipping up landing pages for our products that are doing sort of millions in revenue, and the team is just like looking at me and being like, whoa, how did you just do that? And I'm like, Oh, I mean, it's just like, you know, you know, whether it's Webflow or WordPress or Kajabi, it's all the same kind of stuff. You just like put it together. It's just like, oh, you know, this is obviously the headline. And there's like this whole <laughs> thing that goes into it. But seeing it as a skill is, I guess, something I've not really, not really considered. Yeah, and it, it's really uh, the combination of a lot of different skills, right? If you learn web design, at some point in there, you, you probably learned about uh, user experience and, and did some user research. And, you know, you understand like the flow of eye tracking and like eye movement over a page it tends to go in a Z format where people... Um, you know, at least in in uh, English speaking uh, countries, tend to read left to right, and then they'll angle down. And so, if you want a call to action, you're going to typically put it like, if I want you to to do something, that's going to be in the lower right. And you know, th that at one point that was something that I learned, and that was probably 15 years ago. Mm. And now it's just very intuitive. And so, when I come across a page and someone's like, "Oh, this isn't converting well," it's like, "Okay, well, let's flip the left and right columns. Let's you know, let's change this headline." Your there's so many design things as well. Design is one of these skills that um, I feel very like blessed to have learned early on mm. because it just applies to everything. And someone's like, "Oh, I, this page isn't converting." I'm like, "Well, yeah, it's because everything has the same visual weight, right? Let's make your headline a little bit bigger. That subheadline, let's make it a bit smaller. You know, you don't have to use black text for everything, right? Let's go to like a 70, 80 percent gray." You know, and, and you just add this level of quality and polish to it that becomes very natural when when you do it, and it spreads out through everything. Um, and I see that so often with content creators where they put out this amazing content, especially written content, right? They say words matter; words are the most important thing, and they are. But how you package them changes how they're perceived. And that's what's going to drive if someone actually really engages with it. Mm -hmm. So the number of eBooks that I come across where the content is so good and the actual packaging and, and design of it is so bad. And I'm like, you're missing out on probably half of your audience because they're just be like, oh, you know, the packaging isn't very good. And yes, I am judging a book by its cover or whatever else. And, and I'm moving on because if you didn't put that level of care into one aspect of it, the content's probably not that great mm -hmm. either. And in, in so is uh, in my team. We we still use your authority ebook that you made like ten years ago as like this is what a PDF should look like because <laughs> yeah. like we often like package up things as like worksheets and workbooks and stuff right. for our YouTuber Academy and things. I'm just like sending them authority PDF to be like the, the, yeah, this is a good PDF. <laughs> yeah. Don't just make it a simple like Microsoft like Apple Pages right. and print. Yeah, that was actually. Uh, 
Apple used to have a product around making uh, ebooks mm-hmm. specifically. And I'm trying to remember what it was because that wasn't done in pages or something else. It was done in this other product that they've since discontinued because it was like for the whole iBook format and all of that. And I found that that was the best design tool that wasn't like uh, Adobe InDesign or something, you know, like a full yeah. a full thing. But that, that's funny that you, yeah, <laughs> you no, keep doing this that. This is good. Um, okay, so just st- sticking on this idea of making money as a skill, um, just for one one moment. Um, a lot of people... So it's it sounds like the like the way the way that we're talking about it is it's right now it's it's almost a given that we're talking about having your own business mm-hmm. and learning all the skills to making money within your own business, which I think is also a niche way of thinking about making money because for like ninety nine point nine nine percent of the population making money is a thing that's tied to your job. Mm-hmm. I wonder like ha, what are what are your thoughts on like having a job versus having a business and I guess in your early days what took you down the that the having a business route rather than the getting a job route. Well, so if you think about the ability to increase your earnings in a job, you're fairly limited, right? The default is you're going to get some um, cost of living increase, right? Three to 5% a year, maybe. Um, Now it won't outpace inflation, (laughs) but, uh, you know, or you're going to have to jump roles and level up, right? And and we've seen a lot lot of people, and I had that in my own career, where the first job that I had was making 60,000 a year as a designer, the first professional job. I worked at Wendy's doing uh, food service, you know, and did plenty of web design and all that uh, as well. But in any job, for the most part, your earnings are going to be very closely tied to your time. And you can't really separate those. And so I wanted to get to the point not where I was making 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 a year. I want to get to the point where I was making millions a year. And there just aren't that many jobs where you're at that level. There actually are, but not in the same, not in the worlds that I grew up in. Yeah, right. I didn't grow up in the worlds of uh, private equity, and you know, <laughs> I dropped out of out of school. Like I did, didn't finish high school, dropped out of college, um, and uh, and so I wasn't like, oh, you know, let's go to Stanford and do private equity or or you know some finance thing or or anything like that. And so I was looking for ways that I could earn, you know, far more. And so. I think that's where I've taken on the um, on the earning side is inputs and outputs are completely di- can be completely disconnected um, when what, it comes to. So why not just think? You know what? I've got a sixty k job as a designer. I'm living in Boise, Idaho, which yep. is fairly low cost of living, is my understanding. Yeah, it used to be. <laughs> uh, it used to be. I, guess. <laughs> I can I can live a chill life. I go go to work, do my nine to five, come home, I chill. Like, why not be content with that lot in life? I mean, that's a good question. I, I think I've always been a creator. Like I've always made things. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm constantly learning and constantly making. And uh, I like, I think I just get really, really bored. And I actually, I spent two and a half years working as a software designer at this startup. And I had done freelance web design for a couple of years. Uh, and then in 2000, the beginning of 2009, so at least in the U.S., the economy was down like crazy, and all of my clients like stopped hiring except for this one company. And they, you know, they were like, "Hey, we have even more work. Actually, do you want to just come on full time?" And so I joined them and were there for two and a half years. And during that time, I watched them raise a ton of venture capital. Uh, I think I was employee fifteen. It maybe peaked at seventy or eighty employees, and then they did a few rounds of layoffs, and you know, I, I eventually left. Um, but that was something. I remember going through that process and finding that I was losing a lot of the skills that I valued about myself, right? You, I think it's really interesting if you were to write down, like, what do you value about yourself? And there's probably some things, you know, uh, like how you are as a friend and other things that are like really good. But then, then there's others that are, that you value about yourself that are um, maybe a little more dangerous uh, in the sense that they're they're tied to things that you control less. So one thing that I value uh, uh, about myself and really valued a lot then is how productive I was and how fast I was. When I worked food service at Wendy's, uh, it was all about speed, right? How can you maintain this bar of quality and go very, very fast? Because when we work the drive through there's this big timer over the window and it's basically the amount of time from when a car starts their order to when they're driving away with their food, right? And we we're trying to go, we want under 60 seconds. Oh, wow. Um, and so we would like call up other stores and be like, okay, for the lunch rush, you know, 
uh, we're going to get 58 seconds. What are you going to get? And they're like, okay, we're going to get, uh, I don't know, 57. You know, you're like trying to compete with them and it's just a friendly thing. But we got very, very fast and efficient. And when I did web design, when I went from working per hour to working per project, then I realized that for the first time, the speed and efficiency benefits me. When you work at Wendy's, it's like, wow, you're so fast. Let's have a raise from $6 an hour to $6.50 an hour. You're like, I think I worked really hard and you know, that's not benefiting me. And hourly work, you know, maybe as a web designer, it's $50 an hour or something. Um, but when I went to, oh, let me charge $2,000 for a project, then I was like, wait, the faster I am at this, my hourly rate increases substantially. And so then I was like, okay, how do I template things? How do I stay super focused and all of this? And then when I went and joined this company, I realized that I was losing those skills because no one else in that environment cared that much about working quickly, especially as the company started to struggle. You know, um, there was that first round of layoffs. People let, would spend time like standing around the pool table uh, complaining about how they didn't get paid enough. And I was like, none of us are even working right now, <laughs> you know? And so what I actually did is I realized that I, in my design coding abilities, I realized that I'd lost the skill of speed, right? And I didn't hone and refine it over the previous two years. And I, I had lost that. I would sit down to work on a side project uh, at night. And I realized like, I wasn't very good at focus. I couldn't, you know, something that used to take me two hours to code out was now taking me three, four, five hours. And so what I actually decided to do is, one, I decided I was not going to lose that part of my identity. Yeah. Right. Like that would be a valuable skill. I'm like, no, no, I'm not losing that. And so I ended up switching, <laughs> switching my desk uh, from one that was like in the middle of a big room, like someone else had left. And so there was one way off in the corner. And I got that. And I decided that I was going to be the best employee on that team. And I was going to do it in three hours a day. Hmm. And I was going to spend all the rest of my time like learning to design and code iOS apps, uh, you know other things right and so instead of moving at the slow pace of everyone else and like just turning into someone that i didn't want to be um i was like okay i still need this job <laughs> but i'm gonna knock out all of my work make sure you know i'm ahead of schedule and everything and then i'm gonna be in a place where you can't see my monitor and i'm gonna be studying how to build ios apps mm. and i'm gonna be coding on my own side projects and i rebuilt that that speed and that ability to work quickly and so then Six, three to six months later when I left uh, that company, you know, I had a, uh, a stable of, you know, iOS apps that were making money and I had new skills that I'd built up. Um, but yeah, that that's the thing of like, I'm never someone that's content to go at the same pace as everyone else. Mm. What do you think was it about you that sort of made you different from the other people in your team who were content to chill for eight hours a day and complain about how much they were being paid? <laughs> I just love the juxtaposition between those two things where I'm like, <laughs> it'd be one thing if we were the absolute best team, but we weren't. I've always wanted to get the most out of my time and and move as quickly as possible. So I was homeschooled and I grew up um, with my parents really teaching me that I set the pace. So I remember two different things. Um, the first is I was probably 11 or 12 years old and we lived uh, up in the mountains. And so I remember just the most beautiful snow coming down in the winter and I loved sledding. And I'm just, I, I've got, you know, algebra that I'm supposed to work on and I'm looking outside and this, like the snow looks so good and I just can't focus on it. And I think I complained to my mom about it uh, and, and she goes, you know, you just have a set amount of work to get done. It doesn't have to take an hour or five hours or whatever. Like you don't have to sit here and do school till 3 p.m. You just need to be here and do school until it's done. And like that is the most focused 11-year-old you've probably ever seen where I was like, okay, <laughs> great. Let's get it all done, all of that. You know, my little brother's interrupting me like, no, I don't have time for this. Like I got <laughs> I to get my school done so I can go sledding. And I think like an hour or two later, I was out there sledding because I realized that like, if you cut out all the complaining when you're setting math and all that, like it goes remarkably faster. Um, so that was the first thing where realizing like, okay, uh, it, it's not a fixed amount of time. And the second thing is growing up, I spent the most time with my two older siblings. And so because I like tagged along with them and their friends, 
all of our friends were older than me. And so that wasn't really a problem through like kind of junior high, uh, high school ages. But really once I was just starting high school, they were all thinking about going off to college. And that's when I realized like, oh, this age gap is going to become very noticeable because um, sure, they're only two, three years older than me, but then like I'm going to be finishing out high school and they're going to be uh, going to be gone at college. And so I went back to my mom and I said, you know, is high school like a, a fixed amount of work or a fixed amount of time? And so it's basically the same question that I asked her or that she had brought up about, you know, math homework on a snowy day, but applied to a bigger chunk of time. And, you know, she had homeschooled my older siblings who had already finished high school. And, and so she said, no, I have, I have the exact curriculum, you know, that you're going to go through. You can graduate high school whenever you complete this curriculum. And so I remember thinking that we, we would do these drives from Boise to Seattle, which is about eight or nine hours, uh, to go visit family every summer. And that was before iPads and uh, all of that. And so I remember thinking, like, I'm really bored on this drive. And I'm really bored when I do math. So why don't I just combine these two? And I would do a, like a month's worth of math lessons on a drive over to Seattle. And I had my older brother sitting next to me. And, you know, whenever I got stuck, he could help me. And, and we'd go through that. And so uh, from when I was 13 to when I was 15, I finished all of the, like, high school curriculum. And then I uh, graduated just a little before turning 16. Uh, and then I was off going to college and all of that. So really the idea of you set the pace. Derek Sivers talks about this in his book, Anything You Want, how he went through Berkeley School of Music very, very quickly um, because of this one professor that was like, let me teach you a semester's worth of music theory in like two days. Mm. Um, and Derek talks about how like the class goes at the pace of the slowest student. And sometimes that's you and sometimes that's someone else and it changes based on every topic, but like averages out, it's going to be quite slow. And so I've just always been obsessed with this idea of you set the pace, right? Do you want this to take multiple years? Sometimes it should and sometimes it's the best for you. Or do you want to get it done very quickly? And uh, yeah, that's been that's probably so a defining factor in my life. That's so good. I was just taking, <clears throat> I, was, I, I, I feel like I had so many kind of brainwaves as you were, say, as you, as you were saying that. I think this this idea of fixed work versus fixed time mm -hmm. is really important because if you're if you're for example working at Wendy's that's fixed time yeah. like you know the work is always going to be there it's not like if you work faster you can then put your feet up I suspect <laughs> right but actually in most areas if I think of every job that anyone that I know has or if you're a, if you're a student in school or university it feels like fixed time, but it's actually fixed work. Mm -hmm. Like when I was working as a doctor, I was, you know, it was fixed time. I was there from eight till six, but it was actually fixed work in that if I could see the patients quickly enough and to get everything done and get them seen, you know, yep, all, the charts, all, that kind of stuff, else. all of that stuff is done. Now I have some, I've got, I've got some spare time now. And where a lot of my friends in that context were using that spare time or just sort of going at a leisurely pace because they know they have to be there until 6 p.m. anyway, and because why not? It's a bit more chill. In their spare time, they were like scrolling TikTok or whatever the thing was. Yep. Whereas in my spare time, I had a side hustle. And so I was like, great, I've got an extra 20 minutes that I can like, you know, grind and plan out a new YouTube video or something like that. Oh, yeah. Similarly, when I was at university, you know, going through medical school, I was like, okay, I need to get this essay done as quickly as possible so that I can tinker away on the business I was building on the side or I'm designing a landing page or making a site in WordPress or and, and stuff like that. And it sounds like that was your approach when you had the day job as well. Right. Like, let me get this shit done as quickly as possible so that I can then use the rest of the five hours in the day while I'm being paid to be here to actually learn and improve my own skills and build my own stuff on the side. Yeah, and I, I think that's so important. But most people don't have that side thing. And and many of them are completely content with that, right? Um, I have a brother who has a great career in finance, super happy with what he's doing and, and all that, and, and just has... You know, I'm over here like constantly starting all of these things and all of that. He doesn't care about that. Yeah. I, I think we are both equally happy in life. Uh, and we just have very different uh, different approaches. Um, and But it's just, it's core to who I am that I'm going to figure out, okay, what can I learn? What can I uh, implement? And I always try to find the overlap, right? Like when the iPad came out in 2010, for the startup I was working for, you know, we were designing iOS apps. And so then instead of like doing the minimum 
to, okay, I designed the app uh, at the time we were designing in Photoshop. That was enough. You know, I handed it off. That was all that was ex expected of me. But then I was saying, hey, why don't I learn how to use Interface Builder and Xcode to be able to implement the UI? And let me take that further and, and learn how to program. So it wasn't like I was at my job then doing something 100% different um, on the side. I was saying, okay, how can I do what's expected of me but take it much further in a way that's going to benefit me long term? Mm -hmm. Right? Like I learned programming skills there that were related to my job but not required that I went on to use uh, for years. And I sold, you know, $50,000, $75,000 worth of iOS apps that I, you know, that were an amazing side hustle thanks to the skills that I took further. Yeah, I think that's a really good point around. I think like if, like I'm, I'm always mindful when I, when I do these episodes, speak, speaking to other entrepreneurs and stuff, it can, it can seem as if it's like, oh, starting a business is the only way to be happy. Mm -hmm. But it's really not. Like if someone listening to this or watching this is genuinely happy with their day job, fantastic. You yeah. like the, the, the goal is happiness, contentment, and meaning. The goal is not have a hundred million dollar business. And if you get happiness, contentment, and meaning from the day job, which you really enjoy, and then you go home and do stuff on the side and like have hobbies and have work-life balance. And that, that, that is absolutely fantastic. That is what we're all trying to strive towards in, in some way or another. <laughs> um, but equally, I speak to a lot of my, a lot of people I know who have the day job and they're not content. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, I'm feeling my skills are being stifled. I'm feeling like I'm losing a bit of myself. I used to have all these interests when I was a kid and then they got squashed out of me by the education system, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm capable of more. Yeah. yeah. And those people feel like, oh, you know, if only I could have an extra 3K, 5K a month of passive income or something like that. Oh my God, that would, that would be so liberating. It would, it would buy my freedom. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are some people in my team, you know, as much as I encourage people to have side hustles, you know, Alison, I had of customer success. It's like, I don't want a side hustle. I just want to chill. I enjoy my job. I enjoy my yep. team. I, you know, I get home from work and then I hang out with my friends and I go see musicals in London. And I'm like, great. She's like one of the happiest people I know. <laughs> but I think it's that thing around like, if you are complaining about your situation, then Right, starting a business might actually be a reasonable a reasonable option if you do feel like your job is not helping you reach your potential. Well, I think you brought up something of uh, you know even the one thousand to three thousand a month from a side hustle. You're going to get two huge things from that. First, all of that money is on top of what you already made, and so you don't have the same level of expenses that that money has to pay. And so it's actually like substantially different. Um, you know, as far as the impact that it could make on, you know, your savings or your vacation budget or whatever it is that you value. And then the other thing is the skills that you learn. Like in most companies, if, if say you're at least 10 to 20 people in the company, um, and then it's, it's especially true as you get into a 500 or a thousand person company or beyond, right? There's someone else who knows how to do everything like tangential to your job. And so you're like, I do my thing and, you know, in my, in my case, right? I do the design in Photoshop and I can hand it all off. There are talented people who will build a full app from that. And so you just don't have the same level of growth and development because you don't have to, right? Your job is to do your thing in your lane. And the people who say like, no, I want to know more about everything that my work touches and become obsessed with how much can I learn, right? When you realize that your brain is not this like, as new information comes in, something else has to go out. Right, you're going to do the digital nomad thing, right? You're going to be like, okay, I have, you know, these two suitcases or something, and someone's going to be like, here's this, and you're like, what am I going to get rid of, you know, to be able to make room for this new thing? That is not how your brain works. You're going to be able to continue to take on new information. So, um, something that I'm I'm uh, learning how to be a pilot right now, and so mm -hmm. I'm I'm part way through uh, flight lessons, and something that uh, a friend pointed out is like, once you're a pilot, you're a pilot for life. Like your license is 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 for life. Now you need to like stay current and and all of those things and um, do flight reviews. But I think of it the same way with any of these skills. Like once you're a designer, you're a designer for life. Once you know like the principles of great video and and production and all of that, like you have that for life. Yeah. And so I'm 33 and I'm thinking about like okay, what are these new skills that I have forever? And so when someone presents me with the opportunity to learn a new skill, then I'm like, oh, thank you. Like, uh, like this is amazing. What a gift. Because I'm going to have that hopefully for the next 60 years. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a different mindset than a lot of people have where you're just like trying to fill the time or finish the day. Man, that's so good. 
Today's episode is very kindly brought to you by Huel. Now, I've personally been using Huel regularly since 2017 when I discovered it in my fifth year of medical school. And if you've not heard of Huel, they're a business that creates convenient, affordable meals in a variety of different forms, but all of them are nutritionally complete. So they have the perfect balance of nutrients, carbs, fibers, protein, and fat, and contain 26 vitamins and minerals. And they've now packaged some of their most popular products into their best seller bundle. So you can try out all the Huel products and see which ones vibe with you. There is Huel Black Edition, which is my personal favorite favorite because it's really tasty and it's high protein. So 40 grams of protein and all you have to do is add water or milk and you can shake it up and take it with you wherever you want to go. The bundle also has Huel's instant meals, which you make in the microwave. There's Huel ready to drink range, which are pre-made shakes in a bottle, which is super handy. And I've actually grabbed a few of these in the airport when I've been between flights while traveling. And finally, you'll also get some of the new Huel bars, which I'm very excited to try out myself. Plus, if you're a new customer, you get a totally free Huel t-shirt and a shaker and pot with your first order. Now, I wouldn't recommend having every meal as Huel because that would get a bit much, but it's a fantastic supplement to a healthy, balanced diet. So often for me, I'll have Huel either for breakfast or for lunch, where the alternative would be to otherwise have a relatively unhealthy breakfast. And so Huel is a great way to make sure that you at least have the basics covered when you are living a hectic and or busy life. Huel has very kindly been a longtime supporter of the podcast as well. And I actually did an interview with the founder of Huel, Julian Hearn, which was a great episode, and that's in season one of the Deep Dive podcast. So anyway, thank you so much, Huel, for sponsoring this episode. Now, this season is once again being sponsored very kindly by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for investment advice uh, because they see that I've made money and I've made videos talking about where I'm investing that money. The thing that Warren Buffett and basically everyone who's sensible in the space recommends, which is to invest in broad stock market index funds, which you can do completely for free using Trading212. Trading212 is a fantastic app that lets you invest in stocks and shares and funds in a commission-free fashion. And they've got a bunch of features which are really helpful, which is why I personally use Trading212 to manage a portion of my portfolio. So firstly, they've got this great pies and auto invest feature. So if you're interested in potentially getting into investing, what you can do is you can browse the different pies that different people have created on the platform. So you might get like a hedge fund trader who's gone onto the platform and has created a pie of investments, having done a bunch of research and stuff. And that pie might be like, I don't know, 20% Apple, 20% Tesla, 10% this, 10% that, but it's generally way more complicated than that. And you can see the performance of that particular pie of stocks and shares and funds. And then if you want to copy that pie into your own account, you can just copy and paste it directly in. And then you can invest any amount of money and it will automatically split it according to the allocation in the pie. So if you wanted to just play around with hundred pounds and you were like, okay, that pie looks good. It will split out that hundred pounds based on the allocations of the pie, which is pretty sick. They've also recently added support for multi-currency accounts. Now this is really helpful because for example, if you invest in the S&P 500, which is a US based index fund, then you won't get hit with all the various foreign exchange fees. If for example, you're investing from the UK like I do. And if you have an invest or an ISA account, then Trading212 also gives you daily interest on your uninvested cash in pounds or euros or US dollars. So if any of that sounds up your street, then do please hit the link in the video description or in the show notes, and that will let you sign up to Trading212. And if you use that link, you will also get a completely free share up to the value of £100. So it's literally free money, so you might as well. So thank you so much Trading212 for sponsoring this episode. As, as much as I'm all about like growth and skill development and stuff, I have encountered situations recently where taking an opportunity would have allowed me to build, build new skills. So, so for example, one thing that we've been toying with the idea of for a while, and maybe we'll talk about this when we talk about billion dollar creators, is can we build our own productivity app? Right. We've got enormous distribution. Even if we have feature parity with, with an existing productivity app, we can make our own to-do list and drive tons of traffic to it, and it would be great and, and stuff. But then I'm thinking, oh, but that would require either, that would either require me to hire a CTO or to try and learn the skills to become a CTO and figure out how to hire developers or figure out how to work with an agency and then our costs go up, et cetera, et cetera. And I know I would learn a lot in that process of trying to build a consumer productivity app. Right. <laughs> and I know it would be pretty hard. But there seems to be in, in my in my mind this trade-off of like, oh, it's 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 too much effort. Like it's mm -hmm. it it would teach me a lot of new things, but ugh, it just feel it feels kind of hard. Like, does that vibe at all? Yeah. Well, I think it's the way that I think about setting goals is around what am I going to learn from this goal, mm. right? So we have a goal at ConvertKit of growing to 100 million a year in revenue. Yeah, uh, We sit at 40 million a year right now. And so, you know, in my head, there's like the little, uh, do, I don't, do they do this in the UK? Like the fundraising uh, things, they'll have like a thermometer that oh, they yeah. like color in, you know? So I'm like, okay, we're 40% to, uh, to goal. And it's not, I don't set the goal because oh, I'm going to hit self-actualization when revenue like tips over at that additional digit. What I think of is, what are the skills that I have to learn to build something to that level? And so we talk about how, you know, one of the best paths for you to 
um, build a business worth a hundred million dollars or more is, you know, a consumer productivity app. And we could set that out and that's fantastic. But if we break down and go, okay, that's the goal. Who do you have to become in order to achieve that goal? What skills do you have to learn? And if we write those out, yeah, and it's things that you talked about, right? You have to get very good at understanding uh, user behavior, how to work with developers, how to hire, how to scale a team, like all of these other things. And so you list out all those skills, and if you're like, yeah, no, I, that, those skills aren't interesting to me. That person, right? If we look at future Ali, who has to have those skills and be in that, if that life doesn't sound interesting to you, then great, move on to a different goal. I think too often, we either set a goal uh, without realizing what's going to be required to achieve it, who we have to become to achieve it. Or we go the other way and say like, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. I want to get better at this one skill without a goal in mind. And so I think the overlap of those two things, clearly understanding what's the goal and why, and then who do I have to become to achieve it, is what results in you know something that you're really, really proud of and willing to work on for long enough. Because if you're like, hey, I have this idea for an app, I'm going to throw it together. You know, like it should be live in three months and it should have 100,000 users by the end of the year and, you know, like all of this stuff. Guess what? It's going to not work out that way. Like it's going to be 10 times harder than you thought, take 10 times longer. And if you're we're just looking for like the neat way to use your audience for distribution, then you're going to give up when it gets hard. But if you're like, oh, no, this is the goal, this is the mission, and I'm very clear on who I have to become in order to achieve that, then you'll stick with it when things get really hard. Mm. There's a journaling prompt I've started using, thinking about recently, which is, because you know people say that um, one, one way to figure out what you want is ask yourself, what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? Yep. And I made a list of that, and Productivity App was on the list. But then I asked myself, what would I do even if I knew that I would fail? And productivity app was not on that list. Like, okay. Uh, but there were a couple of other things of like, even if I knew that this would fail, I would still like to do the thing. Like, mm-hmm. I love the idea of building a sort of hour, one to two hour long one man stage show, which is like a combination of like life advice meets magic, because I'm into magic and shit, like hypnosis and yep. that kind of stuff. That would be cool. And it would learn a lot, even if it fails. Right. You'd and be so very I'm proud like, yeah. of that yeah. end product, even if a failure is like like 100 people came to watch it. Once, exactly. And yeah. That's it. And like writing a book, it's like, I even if not many people buy the book, mm-hmm. as long as I've written a book I'm proud of, I'll be, I'll be happy with right. that. Whereas for the productivity app, I'm kind of like, uh, I wouldn't do this unless I knew it was going to be successful. Mm-hmm. And if I knew, and if I knew it wasn't going to be successful, eh, it doesn't seem fun anymore. Yeah. And so in that case, one, that, I love that clarity because it points to what you're going to take away, right? Most people are, are saying this is worth doing if I achieve the goal or if I achieve 80% of the goal. Yeah. And what you're saying is this is worth doing even if I achieve 0% of the goal and I actually like the true goal is the experience and what I learn. And I think that's how you can find what's most aligned mm. to what you do. The, the one thing I would say is often people don't know, I mean, it's it's corny, right? But you don't know what you don't know. And so like for me in building the company, I've spent a lot of time getting good at design and code and marketing and all of that. And I'm trying to get good at building teams and setting goals that keep people aligned. And right, it's an entirely different skill to run a company at, you know, 100 people and, um, you know, whatever, 50, 100 million revenue and, beyond from there uh, than it is, you know, for me to be selling eBooks like I was before. And so the shift that has been most helpful for, for me is to fall in love with the process of building and scaling a company rather than to fall in love with the theoretical destination and whatever that might, uh, whatever that might buy me. And so then when I'm going through something that's really, really hard, then I'm like, Oh no, this, this, the growth from this transition is what I signed up for and what I said that, that I want. And so this is the thing that will make the difference. And then the the last thing that keeps me from getting too discouraged in that is I like to write out my problems that I've encountered and so just sort of have a timeline of them. Hmm. And then to look and say, how would like current me deal with my past problems, right? Hmm. So for example, the early stages of COVID, right? In March uh, 2020, 
you have no idea what's going on. Teams are worried. We were already a remote team. And so we didn't have that like shut down the office um, dynamic. But we had both a crazy amount of growth from people being like, I guess I'll start an online business. And then also a huge amount of cancellations from people saying like, well, no one's traveling. So let me shut down my travel blog. So I'm not paying for all of this. It was a very, very hectic time. And it was, it was really stressful. But now that I've been through that and I feel like I'm three years more developed as a leader, I'm like, okay, I think I can manage that just fine. Right. And there's plenty of other things that I remember being very, very stressed out about. And now I'm like, oh, that, like, that's almost cute how simple of a problem that was. And so that helps me stay grounded when I'm thinking about the things that I'm encountering right now that are so, so stressful. And I'm like, in two years from now, how am I going to look back on this problem? And my goal is that I look back on it and say like, yeah, for, for past me, that was a very challenging problem. But current me would be like, okay, that makes sense. We're on to like bigger, harder problems that we can handle with the same level of stress. And so I love using that growth. That's one, one of the things in journaling is just like, what are the hardest problems? And so you'd be like March, 2020, you know, how to lead a team and navigate through COVID, right? Um, June, 2020 would be, like all of the um, social justice protests and um, Black Lives Matter and, and what to do through that, right? And you kind of just level up all of these things that uh, that you navigate. Even a simple, right? If you have a, the, you build that, that consumer productivity app, okay? What happens when it gets pulled from the app store for the first time? Mm-hmm. Because of some random thing, right? You know? I've been now had that happen on four different apps at different times, right? And so you're like, oh, this is how you do it. This is, you know, and how you navigate it. And so, but in the moment, that will be the most stressful thing that you've probably ever dealt with. Mm. And so I love looking at that growth and seeing the past progress in the same way that if you're going to the gym and you're like, okay, you know, I was doing this, uh, I don't know, deadlift or something. And this was insurmountable. And now like, that's what you do for a warm up set. Yeah. Um, so you're you're in the day job, you're making your 60K, you're completing the work in record time, and al- alongside you're learning how to build iOS apps. Mm-hmm. What happens next in, in the journey? Yeah, I the first iOS app that I built to sell was, uh, I called it One Voice. And uh, my sister-in-law was working with kids with special needs, like who had um, nonverbal autism. And so they could think through everything they wanted to say, but really struggled to, to verbalize it. And so there's these uh, devices that were like ruggedized touchscreen PCs um, that had terrible battery life and cost an absurd amount of money and uh, and all of that. But they would use an app on it that had synthesized speech. So they'd select tiles and then it would like build a, a sentence and then it would speak for you. Um, and so she was doing that. And when the iPad had come out, um, Hannah, my sister-in-law was like, this should just be an iPad app. like, <laughs> But it's such a niche uh, product. And the money is all made in insurance paying for it. And so like these were priced at $7,000 because that was exactly what Medicaid in the United States would reimburse for it. You know, and you're like, all right, I understand <laughs> how this works. Um, and so I ended up making this iPad app that was the same thing, right? And so you bought an iPad for whatever, seven or $800 and you bought the app and um, you know, it naturally had fantastic battery life and barely weighed anything and all of that just because it was on better hardware. Mm. Um, and so I ended up building that app and uh, selling a lot of copies of it. And then uh, I want to say that the app probably made forty or $50,000 over uh, maybe three years. Nice. And that drove a lot of my side hustle. And then... And you built that while you were still working yep. at the day job. Sick. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. We actually, I went to, the job paid for me to go to... Uh, like a developer camp um, that was at the PayPal offices in San Jose. Mm. And they did like a hackathon. And so it was like, oh, you join the team. And, you know, people had their different ideas and you join the team, code with them the whole weekend and meet people and learn a bunch of stuff. And none of the ideas seemed that interesting. And I was there with a, a developer friend from from work. And uh, so we, oh, you know, I was like, does anything sound interesting to you to join? He was like, no, not really. And so then I was like, well, I have this idea for an app. Like, let's design and build it and code away on it. And so that weekend, he helped me with the initial version, and I learned a lot. And then maybe the next few months, uh, you know, I'd, I'd build more. It actually was the way that I learned to code. I always like to make something specific. Mm. Like, I'll do the, the you know, 100 level, like, let me just learn the basics. 
And then I'll get to the point where I, I have something specific that I want to make. And I, I code in every direction until I get totally stuck. And then I would go to a friend. There's a few developer coworkers. And I would like go over to their house on a Saturday morning and be like, okay, I'm now stuck in these three categories. Like, And they'd be like, oh, okay, here's why. Right? Like I'm trying to do something. They're like, do you know about different types of numbers? I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, <laughs> we've got floats and integers. And, you know, like <laughs> there's like computer science 101. Mm. Um, but it was fun to, to get, have someone help me get unstuck. And then I'd be off like coding more and Googling and Stack Overflow and everything else. And, um, but yeah, I built that app. I built uh, one that I called Commit, which was a habit tracking app. So like on, along the like don't break the chain idea, uh, that ended up being really impactful. I built a flashcards app um, that did delayed repetition. Um, and those are the three that like I actually sold and got, got traction with. Mm. To the point where when I quit my job uh, to do freelance iOS design, I had I was making about three thousand dollars a month on the App Store from those three apps. Wow! How did how did it feel at the time to be just getting three k a month from like oh it's amazing making money while you sleep basically <laughs> yeah it's absolutely fantastic and because it was integrated right like the apps that I built helped me get more like demonstrate expertise which helped me get more clients which helped me um, you know both pay for all my living expenses and learn new things that went into the apps that I built and so it was this like you know, virtuous cycle very early on where I was like, oh, this is all directly related. Um, and I was just doing what I wanted. And, and that was also the first time that uh, I was able to like travel and not be tied to an office job. So mm. that was a really good time. Nice. Uh, when was this? 2011. 2011. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, 2011 to 2012. Nice. Okay, so you had your, so you've got the day job, your learning skills on the side, building these iOS apps as a side hustle. You then quit the day the, the day job and you become a, a freelance iOS designer. Designer. Yep. What happened next? When did the ebook start to enter the, the fray? Yeah. So around the time I'd come across a, a guy named Chris Gillibo from reading um, I think he'd written a guest post on Tim Ferriss's blog. And it's one of those things, I feel like this doesn't quite happen as much anymore. Maybe it still does. Where you come across someone's work. And then you just like Binge fall the shit off. Out of yeah, it. you yeah. just just everything. <laughs> yeah. like, and, and the, uh, this was me with your uh, podcast and blog. Oh, nice. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, about like five years ago. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Um, yeah, where you just uncover everything. And so uh, I started following everything that Chris did. And he had this, oh, I remember, like I read everything and it was like, oh, he has a book coming out. Oh, he has a book tour that he's doing for this book. This The book was called The Art of Nonconformity. And then I was like, wait, he has a book tour. Wait, he's going to be in Boise on Tuesday. <laughs> like, and so then I went to the, the event and met him. And, um, but he talked a lot about building an audience and self-publishing. Uh, he had two eBooks that I really liked that were for free. Um, the first one was called A Brief Guide to World Domination. Mm. Chris was always so good with naming things. You know, I just love the juxtaposition. It's sort of like Mark Manson's, right? The subtle art of not giving a fuck. You know, you're like, ooh, these don't. Uh, the juxtaposition within that title works really well. And so Chris, back in you know 2011 or something, is doing a brief guide to world domination. Um, and that was really fascinating. And then he did another one called 279 Days to Overnight Success that was about his blogging journey. And basically him going from uh, starting his audience to earning a full-time living, which he defined as sixty thousand dollars a year, I, th I think in the ebook he has gotten like by the time he publishes it, he's gotten to like sixty-five thousand dollars a year. And he put them into like these beautifully designed PDFs and distributed them. So a lot of what you're seeing, you know, in authority and and all of that is inspired by things I learned from Chris and watched him model. And so he was following the self-publishing path, build an audience, self-publish an ebook, and. Uh, so then I thought, okay, maybe I could do that, but I didn't think I could sell books on that level. And so I thought what I actually want is more design clients. And so I'm going to write a book and self-publish it on designing iOS apps. Um, and then the goal, well, I had two goals from it. Uh, first get a whole steady string of clients, right? You want to hire the guy who wrote the book on, on design. Um, and then 
Also, if I could make $10,000 in revenue over like the lifetime of the book, that would be a success. I didn't want to do like the true or the full like, oh, this um, this book is just a business card. It doesn't have to make any money. Like I think that's a cop out, mm. right? You should try, if you put time into making something, you should try to distribute it to as many people as possible and, and uh, make some real money with it. So I ended up like building a landing page, writing tutorials, driving traffic from the tutorials to say like, hey, I'm writing this book. Um, sign up to get the wait list. Built that email list on MailChimp. Uh, on launch day, I had 798 people uh, on the wait list. And uh, I ended up selling $12,000 worth of the book in the first day. Wow. And so I got hooked on a couple things. One, I realized like, forget freelance design work. Like the goal was to get clients. I never took on another design client <laughs> after that, right? I just, I was all in on self-publishing. Uh, and then the second thing is I just, I became obsessed with the world of like self-publishing and like, okay, what, what can I do with this and what can I do with marketing? And like, I was okay at, at marketing. Like I knew how to make a landing page. I knew how to do some of these things, but then I was like, uh, what can I do? And really it was like email marketing. Like I thought at the time that, uh, you know, Instagram and Twitter and these other Facebook would be driving most of the, the of the traffic, most of the conversions. But it was email that drove all of that. And actually, in Boise, where I live, there's like this OG internet marketer crew that's there because ClickBank and Bodybuilding.com and a bunch of these companies were all founded in Boise. Hmm. And so you get these people who have been around for a long time. And I was talking to one friend, uh, Ron. It, uh, about this and I was like email is selling more copies that like the, than every other channel combined and he just looks at me he's like yeah we've known that since 2003 like what do you want a gold star <laughs> like I'm like discovering this thing that's blowing my mind and he's just like everybody knows that yeah. <laughs> like, I, I didn't and so that kind of that dove into my love for self-publishing and marketing and then particularly email marketing and then actually this, the day after that, I had been using my habits app commit that I'd made to write a thousand words a day. Mm -hmm. And so it popped up and said like, are you going to write a thousand words today? And I was like, no, I finished the book. I published it. And I was like, but it had like 84 days in a row of a streak. And I was like, uh, okay, I'll write, a, I'll write a blog post about how the launch went. So I wrote that up, published it. That drove some more sales, got people paying attention from like a, oh, you know, some random designer can make money selling an ebook. Maybe I could too. And then the next day, the app did what it does and it popped up again and said, Are you going to write a thousand words today? And I was like, Well, what? A <laughs> I, I wrote the book. I wrote all the launch emails. I wrote a blog post summarizing how the launch went. Like, what else would I write? And then I thought, like, I mean, I know web design and specifically web software design really well because that's what I did for years. So it's like, Okay, let me write a book about that. Let me follow a similar habit or similar similar pattern. And so then I wrote a book uh, called Designing Web Applications. It didn't take that long to write because I wrote a thousand words a day. And so 90 days later, I published it. Uh, the email list was up to a couple thousand people at that point. I ended up doing $26,000 in sales of that book in the, nice. first, in the first day. Nice. 50,000 in the first month. Something that I just realized, someone asked me this years ago and I didn't have an answer for it. Uh, but I just made a little connection of why I targeted one day sales because it's like, okay, why does the first day of sales matter? Especially because I have this big spike because I would offer like a 20% off discount if you bought the first day and then that would go away and then there'd be sales tapering off. Uh, Chris Gillibo in one of his articles talked about how he hit $100,000 in sales in a single day from a course launch. And I think that always stuck with me of like the one day thing. And I like, designed my launches around a single day number mm. even though i think the, probably the optimal launch would be over the course of a week mm -hmm. <laughs> you know or but it's interesting these little like examples that stick with you yeah so i yeah always optimized for <laughs> for a single day number but the point is that i got on this path of writing and launching ebooks and just felt like i had discovered something absolutely incredible a couple of questions on this. So I, I I remember now one of one of the early blog posts that came across that you wrote. Well, it wasn't early for you; it was early for me discovering your stuff. Was when you'd written for like an absurd number of days in a row. Yeah. Can you remember how many that was? 
The, the chain got up to six, uh, 600 days in a row. You wrote a thousand words a day for 600 days in a row. Yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, first, a thousand words wow. is not that much. It's, yeah, it's not that much, but it, it's, it, it feels, like, feels like a lot. I mean, it come out, it was like on one hand, so a thousand words a day is probably two and a half pages, yeah. right? And I remember Tim Ferriss talking about this. Chris Gillibo talked about it. Yeah. The way Chris Gillibo phrased it, he had this, like, it's really easy to, what did he say? It's really easy to write a book every year, write 50 blog posts, and another 50 guest posts. Uh, what else? Like a couple long form writing projects, maybe some magazine articles. He like just lists out all the stuff. He's like, it's really easy to do that in a single year. And everyone's like, what? It takes years to write a book. It takes years to do all this. And he's like, if you just write a thousand words a day. And we talk about like habits compounding over time and you know these small things adding up. But 600,000 words is an insane amount of content. That's absolutely insane. And I mean, that that one habit built my entire career, right? Because that's a whole lot of email newsletters. That's It turned into three self-published books because later I wrote Authority. Actually, at this time period, from September, so September 2012, I published the App Design Handbook. December 2012, I published Designing Web Applications. And then April 2013. So like in this like seven-month period, uh, I, I published Authority. And so I wrote three books in that period of time because I was just churning out content. Mm. Um, grew the email list, right? That one habit just was was absolutely insane for me. This episode is sponsored by Kajabi, and they've actually got something really valuable for all of our deep dive listeners. Now, if you haven't heard of Kajabi, it's basically a platform that helps creators diversify their revenue with courses and membership sites and communities and podcasts and coaching tools. So it's one of the best places for creators and entrepreneurs to build a sustainable business. We started using Kajabi earlier this year, and as soon as we started using it, we were like, oh my God, why haven't we been using this product for the last three years? It's got everything you'd possibly need for running an online course or hosting an online community or building an online coaching business. And it essentially makes it really easy to run your entire online business from payments to marketing tools to analytics. Kajabi has everything that we creators need all in one place. And actually, you don't necessarily need a huge audience to generate a sustainable income. A creator on Kajabi can, for example, make $100,000 by converting just 350 customers a year, depending on your price points. And in fact, there are creators on the platform that are making millions of dollars every year with fewer than 100,000 followers across the social media platforms. We've been using Kajabi to host all of our online courses since the start of 2023, from our $1 part-time YouTuber foundations to help people start off on their YouTube journey, all the way up to our $5,000 package for the part-time YouTuber Accelerator, which gives you access to me and my team. And Kajabi does not take any cut of what you earn. Creators keep and own everything. The way Kajabi makes money is through the monthly subscription fee. And even though we generate like literally millions of dollars every year from Kajabi, we're still only paying them a couple of hundred dollars a year. And actually in their lifetime, Kajabi have paid out over six billion dollars to creators, that's billion with a B, and over a thousand creators have become millionaires through products on the platform. Now, back in May 2023, I did a keynote at a Kajabi in real life, Kajabi Heroes event in Austin, Texas. And in that keynote, I talked about the exact steps that I used to grow my business from zero to over two and a half million dollars per year from course revenue alone. Now, people paid for the pretty expensive tickets to watch this keynote at the Kajabi Hero live event. But as an exclusive deal for deep dive listeners, Kajabi have very kindly offered to provide the recording of that keynote completely for free to anyone who listens to this podcast. So if you're interested in getting completely free access to that keynote, just head over to Kajabi kajabi.com forward slash ali that's kajabi.com forward slash ali and that'll be linked in the show notes and the video description as well you just enter your email address and then you will get the recording of that keynote completely for free whether or not you ever become a kajabi customer so thank you so much to kajabi for sponsoring this episode what did it look like like mm -hmm. practically speaking okay so i'll give you some context um our mutual friend sean mccabe mm -hmm. had a course somewhere about writing in ulysses yeah the writing app and i watched that course many years ago and I was like I want to write a thousand words a day this was when I discovered your stuff I did it for like three days and then I, I, I dropped off and like two months ago I rediscovered Ulysses on my iPad and I set the the target like I, I put all of the folders into one folder so I could track that folder and yep. I set a target of a thousand words a day and when I do write and I'm typing away I find myself effortlessly hitting a thousand because it's actually not that many words right. and when I write my newsletter I'm like oh shit this was two thousand words better cut some of it down and I'm curious, what did, for you, what did this process of a thousand words a day look like? What what app were you using? Where were you writing? How did you figure out what you were going to write about? Like, where did the inspiration each day come from? Yeah. 
How did that work? <laughs> well, it was weirdly like the requirement was that it had the app I wrote in had to have really good word tracking because that was the yeah. your word count. Um, and so I used Scrivener because that was the app at the time that was the best at having like individual uh, pages almost. Yeah. But then would be summarized well. Um, it could be compiled total. And so Scrivener let you set a goal like, hey, I want this book to be 35,000 words. Mm. And it would tell you both your daily progress and your total progress against that across all of the like pages down, down the side. So you could organize it and categorize the whole thing. Um, so I wrote in Scrivener. I uh, would, if I'd, when I was writing a book, I would write an outline for it. And then I would take that outline and make folders and empty pages for each title within it. And I would put an asterisk at the beginning of the title if I like hadn't written anything meaningful for it. So I would kind of just skip around and be like, oh, click on this. I don't have anything to say about that today. Click on this. Oh, here's a few notes that I would add to it. And like, oh, there was that article, right? So I'm just kind of compiling things. And then I'd find one. I was like, oh, I have something to say on this. And I would like click in and, and write a whole bunch um, as much as I could on that one topic and then um, keep going from there. And so that it was kind of sporadic in that sense. Yeah. But, um, you know, it eventually built out a full book. And then I have another section for my marketing copy, right? Like another folder at the very end. Because I knew I had to write launch emails and landing pages and all of that. And like, that absolutely counts towards my thousand words yeah. for the day. Everything counts. And there'd even be some days, like, I, I don't like editing. Yeah. And so I would count, and I was like, okay, this is an editing hour. And that to me was equivalent to a thousand words, you know? So I'm like, I'm going to force myself to edit and chop down and all of that. And I'm going to get credit for my day's worth of writing. Um, the other thing that I would do is try to make it easy just in Apple notes to like throw out ideas of like, Oh yeah. Okay. This is what I should write about later. Um, and it's a classic writing, uh, technique, but to end, Oh, who talked about this? Someone famous end in the middle of a sentence. Um, it was someone famous. Yeah. I've cited them in my book, but I can't remember who it was. Was, yeah. it, was it like Hemingway or something? <laughs> like, yeah, something like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Twain, Hemingway, or <laughs> yeah. uh, Einstein or Lincoln or whoever. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Those, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gandhi. No. Uh, and so I, I would just do all of those uh, classic things. And usually when I would sit down and have nothing, nothing to write about, like if you just force yourself to write for like, and you get through that first 10 minutes, then it's totally fine. The other one is Seth Godin has a quote where um, basically about writing, you should write like you talk because yeah. no one, you know, you don't have talker's block, right? That, you know, if you're just trying to talk to yourself and so using now transcription stuff is really good. And so like just talk on the topic. Um, I'll do that when I'm in the car. I'll just start a voice memo and then be like, okay, what do I have to say about audience building? You know, or like whatever the topic is. And then I'm like, uh, okay. And then what about this? And here's a story. And it's all like, nonsense but then you transcribe it and you go through and you're like okay that's a whole thing to write on so it's this and mm. um and then that you know you rewrite it and you get the stories and the structure and, and all of that but it's it's pretty straightforward you just have to force yourself to do it but the, the habit compounds in a ridiculous way this is good shit i'm i'm feeling so inspired right now because <laughs> i feel like if i if i could if i actually sat down and wrote a thousand words per day that would be the single thing that would drive me most towards like literally every single goal that I'm working on. Right. And even goals that I don't even know I have right now because they're all around content sharing creation. my thoughts, content creation, yeah. like writing, making videos. Well, and getting clear all on writing. all of these, all of these ideas, yeah. right? Something we talked about these flagship essays that I like to work on. I have three, um, ladders of wealth creation, billion dollar creator, and then the creator flywheels. These are all on things that I generally know to be true. Or like, I'm like, yeah, this is how wealth is built, but I can't quite explain it. And so through writing, I get obsessive about how do you explain this? Why? Why does this work in a certain way? You know, and then it turns into this thing to get to where I understand the concepts well enough that I can truly teach it. And that's what I, what I love with writing is finding all the things that you intuitively know to be true or observe in the world and then someone's like okay why is that and you're like uh it it just is <laughs> you yeah. know and and that really takes you into like writing forces you to unpack that and then 
one of my mantras in life is teach everything you know, because that turns into, or we have this idea that only experts can teach. And the the main principle behind my book, Authority, is that we don't, uh, people don't teach because they're experts. We perceive them as experts because they teach, right? It's chicken and egg and we have it backwards. Um, and so in that, if you step into a world where you're like, okay, I'm just going to teach what I learned today, then you build the habit and you write it down and someone's like, okay, I'm, you know, following this web designer who is brand new, but they're on a journey to get a, a job at, you know, web design agency. And they're just every day they're sharing and teaching what they learned and they're doing it from a beginner's mindset. And I think you can learn way more from that person. If you're following like two steps behind them, mm -hmm. then following the mm -hmm. super advanced expert who forgot how, like who cannot relate in any way to the problems that an absolute beginner is facing. Um, I thought about that when learning, learning to code in Ruby, which is what ConvertKit is written in, I really struggled to install Ruby. But all the tutorials were like, why would you, you know, they all assumed that that was done, right? And then I came across someone who was a beginner who had said like, okay, I just got this done. Here are the, all the roadblocks that I thought, not like the ideal path, but this is what I actually ran into and how I solved it. And I was learning from someone who was like two steps ahead of me mm. and they actually gave me the answers and I followed them, uh, their content for a long time. So... Anyway, writing, teaching, it all comes back to that. It's all the same stuff, yeah. Teach everything you know. Um, the, the, the book Show Your Work by Austin Kleon mm -hmm. was a big, um, that was the thing that made me start my first blog in like 2016. Yeah. Because I'd been toying with the idea of like, I really want to have a personal blog. But I was like, Ugh, blocked by like, oh, I'm, I don't know anything. Why would anyone follow me, et cetera, et cetera. Show Your Work was just like, share what you're working on. Yeah. And at the time, I'd, you know, I'd been four years into building this medical school admissions company and website design. And I was like, I mean, I have learned some stuff along the way about like how I started the business and all this stuff. It was like, great, I'm going to do blog posts about that. And that was the precursor to the YouTube channel that happened a year later. So yeah. I'm, I'm all about teach everything you know. I love it. Um, yeah, my I used to have three mantras on my wall. And by the way, I love looking at your books because you have show your work uh, in, in the Austin Cleon section of, yeah. <laughs> of your bookshelf. Um, but I, I had these three posters on my wall in like my first real home office. Uh, and there were the three mantras of create every day, teach everything you know, and work in public. And that was like my equivalent of, of show your work. And then the posters, I should bring them back. It's been years since uh, I've done it. But yeah, up in the, like kind of small up in the corner, they say the secret to growing your audience is to, and then the big thing is work in public, create every day, teach everything you know. What do you, what do you mean by work in public? Well, it's the same idea of, of showing your work, right? Like what is the thing that you learned today that you could share with other people. Or so many people say like, okay, I, well, I created my, I wrote my ebook, right? I published and launched it. And someone's like, oh, sweet. I bought the ebook from you. I bought, um, I'm learning app design from you. All of that, that's super useful. But most people don't take the next step and write the blog post about like, here's how I did the launch. Here's how much money it made and everything else, which is actually like the least difficult part. <laughs> you know, everything else, Doing the thing was way harder than explaining how you did the thing and how it went. Hmm. And so working in public in that case was public, the blog post I published the day after I wrote the App Design Handbook that said like, okay, it made, you know, 12 grand. Uh, here's the launch sequence. Here's what drove sales. Some of the, there was some overlap, right? Some people who I wrote the, some people who were designers wanting to learn for the app like or some people who wanted to learn app design were the same people who wanted to read like about how the launch went. Sure. There was definitely overlap, not not 100% overlap, but there's some. But then it brought in other people who wanted to learn about self-publishing who were like, oh, this is possible. Oh, and then I know someone who wants app design, right? And so it was marketing in a sense, even though it wasn't like architected from the beginning to be great marketing. But I think that process all the way along of, uh, teach everything you know, work in public. Those are the things that make a big difference. When I started ConvertKit, I really embodied that work in public idea when I said, hey, I'm going to build a, a software company. I'm going to do it um, you know, only with $5,000 of my money. It's going to be sold or like funded by customers. And my goal is to get to 5000 a month in recurring revenue within six months. And I called that the web app challenge. And I blogged every uh, week about 
Here's how I chose a name. Here's how I hired a developer. Here's the problem that I'm facing. Okay, pre-sales are ready to go. Who wants to buy? You know, like, and I shared all of that. And I think it made a huge difference because people were like, oh, here's someone going on a journey that I want to follow, mm -hmm. right? Unfolding in real time. So not only did I get more attention, but I also got a lot of very like talented, experienced founders saying like, hey, if you ever need help with anything, like give me a call. So um, Amy Hoy did a deep dive with me on copywriting for the landing page, which I then turned into a blog post, right? It's like, here's what I wrote. Here's how Amy and I did it all. I think I even included the recording of the Skype call um, that we had done. And like, here's how we came to the landing page and like all these concepts and, and everything. And I was just sharing what I learned every week um, and sharing that journey. And that has been core to everything in ConvertKit. Like even today, we have a real-time dashboard that shares all the revenue metrics for ConvertKit um, that anyone can look at, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's working in public. One thing that I was thinking about as you were saying this, I'm like, writing is the key. Um, if I could do this thousand words a day, that would, you know, I'm, I'm all about teaching everything I know and creating every day and working in public. All that, sound, all that stuff is amazing. Fully, fully vibe with that. But whenever I sit down to write, so, so, so for example, we did our book launch and there's a lot that I have in my head that I'd love to share about like mm -hmm. how things went and how we're tracking metrics and all this, all this kind of stuff. But then I'm thinking, it's, it's so niche. It's like I could be making a video called 10 Productivity Tips instead, mm -hmm. which would get like a zillion more views than like a blog post that's going deep on this thing that I've learned that I would love to share, but it's just like, ugh. If I'm going to spend time on, quote, content creation, I should spend that time on content creation that benefits the YouTube channel, which is massively leveraged right. compared to a blog post. Any, any, any thoughts on this? Well, so uh, I've heard Nick Huber talk about the way he thinks about things on Twitter uh, at different stages of the funnel. Right. So his business um, is, or he now has a whole bunch of businesses all around real estate, yeah. right, and self-storage and all of that. But what he was primarily thinking about is there's some tweets that are more general. He takes like a um, antagonistic uh, approach to Twitter, yeah. right? He's uh, trying to get some level of outrage or uh, agreement or that sort of thing. Um, but so he'll have these top of funnel tweets that are about life and work and family and and these other things that will really spread. And then further down, you know, the middle of the funnel, he's thinking about, um, okay, what can I share about business? Um, you know, lessons learned that are broadly applicable, but it's people who care um, from here. And then the bottom of the funnel, he'll share like these, I, I've learned a lot about like real estate tax depreciation and all of this stuff from these really in-depth detailed threads that get read by the right people, right? He's putting out content that, I mean, I've been running a business for a decade and, uh, I didn't know a bunch of these things. And so he's going way down the funnel and writing these very niche things. And he's not worried about that attracting at the top of the funnel. And so he's he's going through and saying, okay, what do I do at each stage of the funnel? And because the funnel ultimately for him at the time that he was saying this was um, like getting investors, limited partners for his real estate investing fund. Um, now he has a whole bunch of other businesses as well. Uh, but getting people who know that he knows this stuff inside and out, they want to hire one of his companies to help with one of these services, like that is insanely valuable. But it takes these people knowing that he exists. And so that's the approach that he takes. If some things, this should get millions of views, this should get tens of thousands of views, and then this niche content, if it gets a thousand views from the right people, that's insanely valuable. That's one way to think about it. The other way is... I got to write a thousand words today. What is interesting to me to write down? Mm -hmm. Like what would be fun? If I'm been weirdly obsessive about like a book launch and how it all went, great, write about that. We're just trying to check the box that we did the writing. The writing doesn't have to be the highest quality or the most valuable. Because it's also a little bit arrogant to know that or to think that you're going to create what you create today is the best possible content that you could create. We're not trying to create the best content. We're just trying to create consistently. And then we'll let like the future <laughs> figure out what is actually worth paying attention to. 
And especially because things are going to be pieced together from 10 different sources and you never know what your team's going to be like, oh, this thing, it's going to be super valuable. Or say book number two comes out, right? And you're like, shoot, what, what does make a good book launch? I don't know. I wish I'd written that down <laughs> when I was right in the middle of it. Mm. We run team retreats at ConvertKit and we've run, oh, 10 of them now, something like that, twice a year, every year. And the thing that drives me crazy is when I make a, a small mistake on a team retreat of something that I got right in a previous retreat. It could be a transition. It could be how we set up um, uh, like for an all-team meeting, some of those. So I have a giant SOP and playbook for what makes a great team retreat. That does two things for me. I don't repeat the same mistakes. And then two, when I bring someone else in and they're like, how do we run team retreats? I'm like, there you go. Right, so if you launch, or if you write this book launch article, yeah, I'm going to read it and absolutely love it. And there's going to be, you know, business audience nerds mm. on our level who are like, thank you for writing this. I learned so much. I, you know, I'm plucking this other thing. And a bunch of people just won't care. But then even think book number two, team member comes along and you're like, here's how we do book launches. And you're not sitting down and explaining it to them for an hour because you disconnected your knowledge from your time. And so I think it's hugely valuable to write. And uh, when you write a thousand words a day, you're, you're producing so much content that great, write the 10 productivity apps, <laughs> you video script tomorrow. <laughs> That's a great point. I love, I love both of those approaches. Um, what is interesting to me about this? I think, yeah, one thing I've been thinking about a lot is, <clears throat> I'm sure you have the problem as well, but feeling, feeling overscheduled. Mm. Like there's always just random shit in my calendar where I'm like, right. the key thing that I actually care about is to be able to learn and synthesize and share mm -hmm. and write and make videos because that's like my jam. And I'm finding myself doing all this other stuff that does not involve doing those things. And I realized recently, like, even just like flying somewhere to give a talk is taking time away from like, it's not really the core thing I care about. The core thing I, right. I care about is to be able to write stuff then put it, put it out there on the internet. And so because my writing time is so squeezed, I'm, I'm, I'm now thinking ROI for every single thing that I, I write. And that takes me into this territory of like, well, I could write about topics A to Z that I'm interested in, but actually instead I'll write about topic Y that I don't really care about, but I know it's going to get the views because I only have mm -hmm. 20 minutes today to do any sort of writing at all. And the views of what drives the business and the business and supports the team salary. And it just becomes this thing where I've created a prison for myself right. through overscheduling in the calendar for shit that I don't actually fundamentally care about that stops me from doing the thing I actually care about and I would, I would love to do. And then the commercial incentives are all like fucking all this up as well. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? How do I? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what was on my mind as you were saying that is some of my favorite things that I've written have been when I don't fully understand it or don't quite know how to articulate it yet. And I've pursued input from other people, right? Like the Ladders of Wealth Creation article, uh, it has a lot of input from James Clear on it because it was like, here's this thing that I'm trying to articulate. And yeah. we were at a friend's uh, bachelor party for, for a weekend, you know, and it's a whole bunch of business friends. And so we're all like nerding out <laughs> yeah. on the essays that we're writing and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, different vibe than maybe a traditional bachelor yeah, party. Yeah, I was going to say, that sounds like a great <laughs> bachelor party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is exactly the kind of bachelor party that I'm into. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about these things and... He would, he's just asking really good questions and filling in examples. And he's like, well, why is that? Why, like, how else, how could we visually describe that? Um, and that pursuit of an idea with someone else, I think is really interesting. So as you're talking about like, oh, I'm going off to like deliver this talk and it's not furthering my like writing and, and ideas and learning goals. My first thought is, well, who else is going to be there? Who would you love to not just catch up over, over coffee, uh, coffee, but like say, hey, here's, you know, I'm nerding out on flywheels for creators. Like you want to grab coffee and talk about that for an hour, right? Because I'm trying to like this essay doesn't quite work. And um, that kind of thing is really, really interesting. So I would try to combine that. And then I think broadly the point that you're making of like, what is the ultimate engine that drives your business? And how do you spend your time? there and you're saying like writing an idea generation is the ultimate thing yeah and so make sure that that is the the core thing on your calendar um, yeah 
Because ultimately, if you stop making YouTube videos, if you start stop sharing ideas with your newsletter, yeah, the rest of the business stops. Everything out. else dies. Yeah, yeah. It it to be clear, it has so much momentum that it will. It will take a while for it to die, it'll but it'll take, still die. But it will. Die. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We should keep paying our convert kit monthly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> monthly At some point, dues. you're like, wait, this isn't making as much money as it did. Hey, every time we look at a software bill, I'm just like. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like 40% of it is ConvertKit. <laughs> like, fair enough. We make way more money from ConvertKit than we spend. So it's, yep. it's totally fine. Um, that's a good way of thinking about it. I just, it, just, it just comes down to a thousand words a day. A thousand words a day. A thousand words a day will literally change my life. Yeah, it's crazy. A thousand words a day would change the life of anyone listening to this. If they've gone an hour and 18 minutes into this podcast, <laughs> if you actually listen to this, you actually write a thousand words per day. It's just, just, damn. You know, so even saying that, right, I did it for 600 days in a row. Uh, I actually ended up getting shingles after that. And so that's sometimes people ask, like, well, why aren't you at like 1200 days in a row now? It's like, well, I I ended up getting really sick and took me like six months to recover and all that. But I guess the way to put it is it is simple, but not easy. Mm. And so, yes, writing a thousand words a day will absolutely change your life. And that is a very simple thing. But it is not easy to do. And you have to design your day and your week around that habit. And that has to become one of the non-negotiables. And that's something that, honestly, I've struggled with, right? As I go back and forth between, you know, building a team and scaling and all of that. I know that all of my goals would be furthered by writing a thousand words a day. And I still write fairly sporadically right now. Like, I haven't rebuilt that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because we say things to ourselves like, oh, this should be easy. And because we're conflating simple and easy. It is very simple and it is not at all easy. And so if you get clear with yourself that like, okay, I am setting out to do something that is in fact very difficult and I have to design my day around and my week around making sure that this can happen. And this has to become my number one priority in my business. Then at that point, you can actually make it happen. But mm. if you're like, oh, this this will be really easy. I'll just knock it out and then move on. Uh, then you'll get to the point where you can't build up any meaningful streak and you won't get the results from it. Any other tips? Any mistakes you made along the 600 day thing that, you know, I I feel like I feel like I want to commit to that. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm going to commit to this. Okay. It's writing a thousand words a day and I want to get ahead of any kind of, <laughs> what are some some obstacles I might run into? And also, are you doing this on weekends as well? And yeah, I did it seven and, days a week. Okay. Right, like if it's, if it's that important to you. Yeah. The ideas flow seven days a week, why not? Yeah, exactly. Um, the first thing I would say is when you run out of ideas, a lot of people worry that they're going to run out of ideas. And so they say like, oh, I might as well not start. Generally, what I find is the more that you write, the more that you have to say. Because you find these threads and you uh, unravel them. The next thing is, if you even with that, if you're still running out of ideas, think about things that, think about the content that you're going to consume that's going to help you uh, find new ideas. Mm. So like if you get out of your usual podcasts yep. and start to listen to other things, right. Or the business biographies or, and you have these prompts, right. You're like, okay, what would, uh, you know, if you're reading like John D Rockefeller's biography, you're like, what would Rockefeller do if he ran ConvertKit? You know, and you're like, oh, interesting. Well, he'd probably have all these backdoor deals and he's probably acquiring other companies. And, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. oh, blah, blah, blah. Somehow he creates a monopoly and I, I don't know how it works, but, it, you know, it's a fun exercise. Yeah. Right, so you can have these prompts to dive into. But, like, I uh, listened to Ryan Holiday on Jocko Willink's podcast. Um, I don't normally listen to Jocko's podcast, but I love Ryan's work. And so I was like, great, I'll listen to this. And it was a really interesting take. But Ryan said this thing about... Um, He was talking about how Tim Ferriss in the early days of like Audible really getting traction started buying up the the audio rights to a bunch of books because you had this weird moment in time where Audible was getting traction and publishers did not value audio rights. Mm. So like Josh Kaufman, who wrote The Personal MBA, sold the publishing rights to his book as you normally do. Uh, The publisher didn't want the audio rights, so then they sold it to somebody else. And then it kind of bounced around and then they were going like, he, he was like, I don't like this. And so he asked, can I buy them back? And so for like $10,000 or something, he bought back the audio rights, the personal MBA, uh, published it himself through audible. Audible had this crazy distribution thing where like the more copies you sold, the higher percentage you got of every copy sold. And it ended up, it got to the point that at one point Josh was making like 50 to $60,000 a month, uh, off of 
exclusively the audio version of the personal MBA. Nice. Tim Ferriss understood this and started going around buying the audio rights to any book where the audio rights weren't valued. So um, you have the obstacle is the way on your shelf. Uh, Tim Ferriss owns the audio rights. Oh, does he? Oh, I didn't know So that. the obstacle yeah. is the way. Um, and he did this for a whole bunch of books. Yeah. And did it for like the Seneca uh, Letters, one of the Stoicism Letters. letters. Yeah, that's yeah. the one, yeah. Um, yeah, so he he's done it for really a lot because there was this moment in time where audio rights were radically undervalued for yeah. um, what they got. And so it made me think, like listening to that episode, one, I had been around, like I knew Tim and I knew Ryan back then. And so I remember talking to, like I remember hearing that and seeing it all unfold. Um, but what it made me think of is this phrase of like, who's playing chess when other people are playing checkers? And now that's turned into a prompt for me of like, okay, where, where in my business am I playing checkers when I should be playing chess? And then what other th- like stories can I share on my podcast or, or other things where uh, someone is operating at that level? And like, I wouldn't, like that is now a, a consistent thing in my journal, that phrase. What would it look like to play chess here? You know, who's playing chess when others are playing checkers? Um, and I only got that because I listened to a podcast outside of my normal, uh, like my normal flow. So when you're running out of ideas, um, I guess two things on that. When you're running out of ideas of what to write about, switch up where you're consuming information. And then the second thing is try to have these consistent prompts that you come back to that lead you to interesting places. And so two of mine are, what would this person do if like to tackle this problem? And then another is, you know, what would it look like to play chess rather than checkers? And if you end up with a stable of like 15 or 20 of those, then you can go like problem or story and then prompt. And that will uh, result in some interesting thoughts. Some of which hopefully will be worth publishing. Um, so you write a thousand words a day, but presumably you don't publish a thousand words per day. Yeah. What does the, uh, yeah, what does the publishing segment look like? I think, I mean, it's entirely uh, up to you. You know, I would just pick something and stick with it. I think publishing a newsletter once a week and then, um, or an essay, sometimes newsletters are, are a little too low quality and I'd rather people focus on like flagship content. I struggle with that back and forth of like staying consistent versus being really, really high quality. Mm. Um, I would just say pick a frequency and stick with it. Uh, and it has to be, uh, you want it to be at a point where you're not too frequent so that you can't hit your quality bar. Yeah. Right. Some people are like, I'm going to write every single day. And then I'm like, well, you're not Seth Godin, mm. <laughs> you know, you don't have that like level of input of ideas and, and all that. So I think once a week is a good consistent cadence. It forces you to stay on topic and explore. Mm. Um, but then you need something that you're really pursuing, right? Like uh, some thread that you're trying to pull on mm. and unwind or like a book that you're writing yep. or, or like a meaningful project. Um Otherwise, yeah. it, it, it'll fizzle out. Um, so I've got about four different book ideas that I want to yeah. sort of pursue. Me too. And <laughs> I love the idea of, I was speaking to Mo Gaudat about this, who wrote mm. Soul for Happy, and he, he has about six different book ideas. And he says each day, he does 2,000 words a day. He said, I just pick whichever one takes my fancy and I just take yep. her away at it. Do you do something similar where you're like, or would you recommend that? Or do you think it's, it's helpful to have just one thing that you're working towards? I think no matter what you do, it's important to have a way to capture the ideas yeah. that are sparked. Because sometimes, like I have four different book ideas, I think, and they sort of overlap. Like, is it this book? Is it that mm. book? And, you know, what order should they be published in? Yeah. And so the the biggest thing is get the ideas down on paper and then, you know, either edit it yourself or hire an editor. Someone else will come along and be like, oh, no, 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 this story yeah. is actually the thing that we're going to use here. We're going to flip the whole thing around. Um that's something that, like the order of the Ladders of Wealth Creation article is very different after James got his hands on it. It was like, mm-hmm. no, 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 the, like read the whole thing, <laughs> you know, but like, let's, uh, let's represent it like this. So I would be in the camp of just write if that's what works for you, unless you're so scattered that it's not working for you. Sure. And then like force yourself to, to stay consistent. But otherwise, like, as you're writing one thing, make sure that like the documents and the structure for the other thing exists so that yeah. you can be like, oh, this does belong over here and you have a place to put it. And so it's not not lost or wasted. Sick. 
this is so good. Okay, I'm going to commit to this. A thousand words per day. That's that's the thing. That is the one. Um, oh, one other, you are asking for tips. One yes. other thing is <clears throat> there are days that you can't, for whatever reason, or shouldn't write a thousand words, right? Where, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to go, I, I don't know, like with my uh, partner, I'm off to go do this thing. I'm going to be entirely focused on time with them or whatever. And so people are like, well, what do you do? It's like, oh, just write more on the bookends, you know, build up and be like, hey, uh, you know, for this holiday weekend, I'm not going to write. And so I guess for the preceding week, I need to write 1500 words a day to get ahead Nice. and, and plan ahead like that. And then also look at your calendar and say like, oh, it's going to be really hard to hit uh, to like to write on these days because of whatever is happening. And so I'm going to make a plan for it right now. Ultimately, yeah. like, you know, I'm going to get up earlier that day. I'm going to uh, write in advance, you know, any of those things. Yeah. And there were days that I like f- forgot to write. And instead of being like, oh, I broke the chain and all of that and getting upset about it, I would just write double the next day. Mm. Yeah. So like the, the goal is 600,000 words in 600 days, not, you know. Not literally a thousand words a day. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. Yeah, because it gives you the flexibility while also being able to maintain the chain as it were. It also helps you think of it like a job where it's not day by day. It's like the the big picture. You know, mm-hmm. if it was like, hey, I have to keep this factory moving all the time, like with this level of output, you know, but we want to take this week vacation. No problem. Mm-hmm. Just increase the output by 50% for... The preceding week or two weeks, yeah, and you're good to go. Easy, That's so good. <laughs> simple, not easy. <laughs> simple, not easy. Exactly, yeah. Simple, not easy. Um, what do you? What are your thoughts on a personal blog? Just broadly, and I ask because. So I like your website. I like NathanBarry.com. It's it feels personal. It's good vibes. I'm unsure what to do with mine. I, my website, AliAbdal.com. Uh, it started off as a bit of a personal blog. It's now morphed into like, well, this is good lead gen for the business. And so yep. we should get ghost writers to write a shit ton of articles about how to grow on YouTube because then that links to our YouTube, of course. But then it sort of loses the charm of like a personal blog. And I like the personal blog from an artistic sense, even though it may not make sense, may make less sense from a commercial sense. Right. I wonder what it, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on this? I don't have that exact problem because I have ConvertKit and NathanBerry.com mm-hmm. fairly separate. Yeah, you know they, they like linked. ConvertKit is more of a publication, like they yeah. Blog, the and it's stuff clear that other people are writing. You know, the yeah. vast majority of that content. Um, now, if you're trying to split it, and it's like, okay, you know, one one thing to be like, oh, we'll spin out another site. It's like, well, but then I'm gonna have to build domain authority for that new yeah. site, and you're like, ah, like yep. <laughs> don't do that. From an SEO perspective, I would think of it, of it like. Maybe you have these like flagship um, guides mm, yeah. that are really going deep on and going to rank very, very well for yeah. you know how to grow a YouTube channel. These these high intent search terms that are going to be worth a lot of money to you. Yes, right. This will turn into a five hundred dollar course purchase. This will turn into you know, if someone's trying to trying to do that, and I'd build those funnels really carefully, and then. Like I wouldn't do the ghost written um, one off random things to rank mm. because I think Google rewards the flagship articles much more. Yeah, get tons of ghost writing help on those, right? Like make them amazing. Yeah, it should be the brain dump of your ideas and then have a great editor like really go through it. So this is something that you're really you know really proud of and can link to and keep updated for years. Yeah, but I would keep the personal stuff going. I, I think that's something that's missing from the internet right now mm. is like the classic this is what i'm thinking about and i'm just following that i, I wish i did it more mm. um i do it a decent amount in my newsletter but um yeah like what something that i'm trying to do is like scale it back just just like one notch on the level of polish so that not everything has to be a fantastic essay or something else like i want that more raw feeling yeah. and less marketed but that's just because that's what I want to exist on, on the internet. Yeah, same. Mm. Like I, I really like discovering a personal blog, mm-hmm. and it's so nice. Um, yeah. One thing, what, 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 one thing I, I, I liked less about yours is the fact that your podcast. Blog I know, posts, me too. It drives me crazy. 
And I'm just like, oh, I, I just want to read the Nathan Barry like archives. I don't want a 078 interview with Sahel Blue. It's like, yeah. I would love for that to be separate. <laughs> There's a yeah. bunch of those things. Yeah. That <laughs> I'm like, uh... And I have the same issue with mine. It's like latest articles. It's like they're all podcast episodes. I'm like, oh, that's, uh, it's, not, it's, not the, it's not the vibe. Yeah, and it, it's like, what I want, which of course I have people on the team so I could just, I just pay to do it. Actually, it's kind of a weird thing. I have a lot of people on the ConvertKit team and I don't really have people on the team Nathan, Nathan. No, on team Nathan. And yeah. so you end up with this like, oh, you know, they make like it's the WordPress install is in like the ConvertKit WP engine server. And so they make sure it's updated and all of that. But it's like, yeah, they have other things. Uh, but yeah, I want the site to like be like, these are the flagship essays. These are the recent random musings, you know, I want it to be the kind of site that it's easy to get lost in mm. of where you're just like, go down the rabbit hole and binge it all. And, um, but yeah, it's, yeah. I, I would definitely, what I want more people to write about is what they're most interested in. And then like the behind the scenes, the content, like I can get the 10 productivity app tips, a handful of different places. Yeah. But like, I want to read the like obsessive book launch things or like, Here's how, like, I loved uh, Tiago Forte's content about how he built out his yeah. garage studio, you know? And it's not like, in theory, this is how you should do it. It's like, this is what I actually did. Um, and so I just love that, like, the the show your work kind of things. Because mm. um, I want to follow, I want to follow the person more than I want to follow the advice. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the... One of the issues, and I think, I think maybe this sort of the, the Nick Huber funnel that you, you mentioned solved this, but one of the issues is when, and I, I guess every, every media outlet has this issue, where it is the the BuzzFeedy 10 productivity apps yep. stuff that will get the clicks and get the views from a mainstream audience, mm -hmm. even though that's the stuff that's just like objectively less interesting. <laughs> Yeah, And the more interesting stuff, it does not get those views, but maybe, and I like, I like the way you phrased it, sort of views from, I guess, quote, the right people. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to attract an audience of, like, if I want people like you to read my blog, someone like you is not going to read my article about 10 productivity hacks, because like, right. why would you? But if I said, if it was a, an in-depth look at how my book launch went, and like, the numbers behind it, and the screenshots, and how we tracked things, and fathom, right. and then the graphs, and shit, like, you would read that. Mm -hmm. And you're the sort of person that I would like to be part of my newsletter, because <laughs> right. it's like, you're Nathan Barry, it's like... <laughs> The, yeah, it's like the, the 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 people who are executing at a high level will read niche stuff. Not uh, whereas the uh, there's, there's just this sort of separation of like the mainstream world. And it sounds weird to kind of say this because I don't want I don't want people listening to this to think that I'm ungrateful for the audience audience and stuff. But it's just like someone like you or someone like Tim Ferriss would read a very different blog post right. compared to a random person in the audience who doesn't have their own business, for example. Well, and the great thing is that you can segment audiences. Right? And I think that people don't do that enough, mm. right? I've written a lot about how to earn a full-time living as a content creator. That's a topic I'm very passionate about. At some point, I feel like I've written enough about that. And mm. there's enough written on the internet, uh, you know, by the like zero to 60,000 or zero to a hundred thousand. The gap that I felt like was there in the market is like, okay, you've done that. You now have, if you understood audience building and leverage and marketing and everything else enough to get to a hundred thousand a year in revenue. I bet with the right steps, you could get to 500,000 a year. And what I wanted to write about is, okay, what happens now? You're not making $500,000 a year, more than you ever thought possible, more than anyone else in your family, more than, you know, all of these things. What do you do? Because there's real problems that come with that. And I wanted to write about that topic, but I knew that's not what you write about to a 50,000 person, 30,000 person email list. Yeah. And so what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to create my own paid newsletter. It's only paid so that there's a little bit of a barrier to get into it. I don't really care about the money from it, but uh, I called it my secret money newsletter. And I said, it's a hundred bucks one time to get on the list. Rather than committing to like writing every single week, I made an, an email course. And so I started it when I had like six emails written out and you'd get one every Friday. Yeah. And then whenever I felt inspired, I'd add another one. Yeah. It's now 17 emails long and people just get all the emails and they wait at the end until I add another one and then it'll be 18 and so on, so on from there. But it let me write to a different audience without the caveats. Mm. Cause I just said like, look, if you're making less than 200,000 a year, this is not for you. 
If you thought for even a second about, is $100 worth buying this thing? This is not for you. Uh, And it's been so much fun because I segmented my audience and I'm talking about like, okay, what are your favorite things you've ever splurged on, right? Like uh, a VIP tour at Disneyland for like your family and friends. One audience would be like, that is absurd that you spent $4,000, you know, or whatever. You're spending $500 an hour for someone to help you cut the lines at Disneyland. But then some other person is going to be like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, how do I, you know, <laughs> how do I book that? What other tips do you have? And even little things like there's people in my life um, who have helped me reframe things around money in a really important way. And I want to be able to pass that on. Um, like my friend Mark at one point was talking about um, investing. Like I assume that once you get to a certain level, then like investing, it's really complicated. You have to have like financial advisors and you have to, you know, you like, you have all these new opportunities. And so it means all this stuff. And he's like, look, we were talking about it and he'd built up, uh, I think his, his Vanguard investing account about $5 million from his creator business, just continually, you know, for a decade, putting in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, just funneling all his profits in. And I was like, but don't you have to do more complicated things? He's like, no, the Vanguard account functions the same at a hundred grand and 500 grand and 5 million. Like it just works the same. Like it, it doesn't matter. It's like, well, isn't that a ton of money to keep in Vanguard? And he's like, no, think of the grand scale. <laughs> like they're like $5 million doesn't even register for that. You know, <laughs> yeah. they probably have like billions, of, do- yeah, billions, billions of, of dollars yeah. in single Vanguard accounts. Yeah. Uh, and another moment when ConvertKit first got a million dollars in our checking account, Right to operate the business and the you know all that we we'd saved up to that, that point. And I asked in this software founders Slack group, um, like, what do I do? What fancy? Like, what do I need to set up? This is all that. And this guy Ian, who runs a really successful uh, SaaS company, just said, like Nathan, a million dollars is a very normal amount of money to have in a checking account for a business. And I was like, what? But don't you? And then I realized, like, oh, yeah, that's just how businesses operate. So there's there's these conversations around money that I wanted to be able to write out and I wanted to do it in two ways. I wanted to do it where I can create something once and it continues to work for me forever. So I'm not on a content treadmill and where people are like, Nathan, where's this week's essay or something like that. Uh, And then the second thing is I wanted to do it to a niche enough audience that they would care about and value the same things. And I wouldn't have any of the like, here's Nathan bragging about something related to money, right? And so I think that tool of like an email course or a private section of your, of your blog or something else is really great for that because you can explore what you care about, niche it down to only the people who care about that. And those are also my favorite replies, right? Like uh, I'll write one on like if my favorite splurges once mm-hmm. you have money. And then mm-hmm. I just say like, hey, what are your favorite splurges? Mm-hmm. And people will reply and say, oh, this one time I – we took another couple on this, uh, like, oh, what was it? like a, a bikes and barges cruise throughout, like a river cruise throughout Europe where you like rode your bike all day from one city to another, like stopping. And then you like got back on the, you know, river cruise boat and stayed there for the evening and it like repeated over and over again. They're like, it was an amazing experience. And yeah, it cost, I don't know, $10,000 or, or some really meaningful amount of money, but they're like, but it was amazing. So I love reading all of those stories and getting the replies. And I feature the replies in future editions um, of the the newsletter. And so it makes this little community. So that's the way that I handle it of like being able to write the niche topics that I care about and just segment it to a niche audience. That's really good. I'm going to sign up to the secret money newsletter right now. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I, I heard some, I heard or read somewhere, might have been one of your podcasts, is is this the same newsletter where you where you reveal like personal income details and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I have uh, about once a year. I have like an update of this yeah. is my net worth and where I invest everything. And, Interesting. Yeah, because I want to write about this stuff. The other thing is, I want to read back all my own previous stuff. Mm-hmm. Right, I write a year in review blog post for the last, I think twelve. I'm, I think I'm twelve years in yes. of writing. You know, you just nathanberry.com slash like 2012 dash review, 2022 dash review. You'll get there. And I'll even pull up stuff. Like I wanted to show someone a photo the other day. And I was like, oh, I know the URL structure for my blog so I can get to that really quickly. But those are written for me because I'm like, oh, what was I struggling with in 2013? What what did I value in 2017? Where did I 
go, right? I'll go and look through all of that. Oh, there's the kids when they were really little. There's, you know, all these different things. And so, yeah, I'm just creating content for me and trying to have that archive. I just also put it out on the internet because I guess I'm weird like that. That's cool. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, because I've been doing these videos for the last five years or so about how much money I make on YouTube each mm -hmm. year. And they're getting more and more absurd. And I'm kind of like, I don't know if I want to continue doing these. In a way, it does sort of paint a target on my back to some degree because people might think that business revenue is equivalent to personal money in the bank, which it's right. really not. And, and you it's don't like need to get like kidnapped outside your flat. Yeah, or that's the sort of thing. I don't want that to happen, especially if I get married, <laughs> have kids, and things. Um, but I like, I do like the idea of being public and mm -hmm. transparent about stuff like this. There is a point that it that it becomes entirely unrelatable, um, and so that, like, I I wonder the same thing. Mm. Um, like for ConvertKit, you know, we're public with our metrics, mm. but our business has gotten a lot more uh, complicated or sophisticated. And so now like our public dashboard only shows, you know, one revenue line and we have mm. three and, you know, and, and then I'm thinking about like, okay, is this still serving the same, same journey? So the, yeah. yeah, sometimes they, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a balance. Um, and I don't know. And especially because you're right, people don't understand money. They're like, okay, oh, you made $5 million off of this. That's absurd. You know, so you probably took home like $4 million and you're like, you're like no, <laughs> no, no one did. <laughs> no. I wish <laughs> that is not how it works at all. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a point where you would stop. And one thing that I would say, because I've struggled with this, just to make clear, yeah. is you don't owe this to anyone. Mm. Right, there's a point where if you create content for a long period of time, people will start to treat you like you owe them that you continue to create that content. Yeah, true. And you don't. Like, do it for as long as it serves you in that way, and you can change people. Be like, oh, Ollie, why are you not releasing that video anymore? Like, you know, and you're just like, look, it wasn't interesting to me. It wasn't serving me or the, or the business. And, you know, if you need that roadmap, <laughs> look at the last six years of, this video that I put out. Nice. Um, I, I also wonder about, uh, this is kind of an, uh, a struggle for me on like how much lifestyle things to share. Of uh, like, Here's my fancy house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's my fancy house or uh, if you charter a plane to go somewhere, right? Or, or um, you yeah, know, who knows, private tour at Disneyland or like all these things, a fancy car. You, it's a weird a thing where I like don't on one hand don't feel like sharing any of that stuff, but on the other hand, if you do share it, like it drives um, like lots of attention, right? Like my friend Dan Martell uh, just bought his own plane, mm -hmm. right? And he doesn't live that far from me, like right. At, you know, it's like a ten hour drive. Yeah, you know, but like commercial flights, it's ridiculous to uh, to get there where he is up in Canada. It's and in like Kelowna. Kelowna, yeah. yeah. I've been trying, trying to plan a trip there, but it's a fucking nightmare to get to. It's really, yeah. really difficult. I want to get him on the podcast and like, like <laughs> yeah. his, his, his new vlog and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's so much good stuff. And so I imagine, I haven't talked to him about this, but I imagine when he bought the plane, you know, there's a whole thing of like, oh, should I share this? You know, like that puts, that's a different level of wealth. Mm. But then on the other hand, in sharing it, he's getting a whole bunch more attention because there's someone scrolling through Instagram like, he owns a plane? Who is this guy? Yeah. Right? And they dive in, they find his stuff, and they end up like using his his advice to grow their business and, and all of that. So that's something that I struggle with a bit mm. is at what level to share that. Because on one hand, I um, like live a pretty simple, straightforward life on a farm in Boise. Yeah. Uh, and then on the other, like there's things that I spend absurd amounts of money on and I'm, I, I absolutely love it. And so it's like, oh, you know, like do I need a marketing photo like that? You know, yeah. uh, not that I have a Lamborghini, but if you did that or like a Ferrari or something, right? You could get a lot of marketing mileage out of that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. So you got to figure out what what your brand is and, and what you want to share. Yeah. Yeah, at one point I was doing like, you know, I did a, a a tour of my apartment in Cambridge, mm -hmm. which was cheap. It was like fifteen hundred pounds a month rent, uh, or the or the or the rent equivalent. And then I moved to London and I moved into a fancier one. And I was like, okay, let's do a clickbait title. And even though it was renting, we we called it like my my two point five million dollar apartment tour. Yep. And there was something about that. I was just like, oh, this feel, <laughs> oh god. And like, 
Now, this place is even more expensive than that, but I've not mentioned it. Well, I, right. I haven't really talked about the price unless someone's explicitly asked me on the podcast. And I like the idea of being, I like the James Clear approach, kind of. The James Clear approach is basically, I want to be known for my ideas. I don't, right. want, be, I don't, I don't want to be known for my face or like my lifestyle or anything like that, even though yep. it's making fuck tons of money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I do like, I do like, I've, I vibe with your thing about the whole transparency side and sharing mm-hmm. and, you know, the fact that like, Dan, if, you know, Dan Martell talks about how he, how he has a plane and be like, I'm way more likely to follow his stuff and I'd be interested because I'm like, oh shit, I, I'm not thinking of that as him bragging. I'm thinking of it. Right. That's really cool. That's inspiring. But I know that there are lots of people out there. I, I speak to my grandma. I was chatting to her yesterday and she was like, oh, Ollie, please talk about, stop talking about how much money you make. And I was like, oh, but it's inspiring to people. And I, so many people have said to me that like, because of that video, they started a YouTube channel. And she's like, yeah, but you know, everyone else out there is just sort of feeling, they're not feeling inspired. They're feeling like hurt because they haven't right. achieved that. And I'm just like, oh yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And it's challenging, right? Because you don't know and you can't control how someone's going to react to your content. And whether someone's going to say like, uh, like I feel envious of that or someone who goes, oh, I could do that. Mm. Right. So years ago, actually before I published the app design handbook, I was wanting to write and I had like kind of start and stop and, you know, work on this ebook. And then on the same day, these two guys, uh, Jared Drysdale and Sasha grief published ebooks, self-published ebooks to small audiences about design. And it was pure chance they launched both of these on uh, Hacker News on the same day. Sasha had this, like, it was like a design case study where he walked you through how it went and he sold it for, I think, $6. And then if you wanted to buy, like, the one with the Photoshop files with it, it was $12. So we had these two, two prices. And Jared sold his book for $39. And it was just that one price. And it was fascinating to see both of these happen on the same day. And it was like, you know, you're like looking at them ranked in Hacker News. And you're like, that's that's interesting. And then Jason Cohen, who's the founder of WP Engine, invited both of them to come on his blog and say, like, write a, write a guest post about your pricing model, how your launch went, and like why your pricing model is better than the other person, right? That's fun. Uh, and so it was great fun. And so I read both of those. He published them like one after the other. I read both of them and thought a couple things. One, you can make money self-publishing. Two, these guys are just like me. They're designers with small audiences, you know, self-publishing a fairly niche product. Compared to like reading about Jason Fried, who's like, oh, look, we made 500 grand self-publishing. You should too. (laughs) And so it really resonated with me. And I've heard a lot of other stories of people saying like, okay, like, I'm paying into the story and like there is a black woman like me who accomplished that. There's this person who lives in my country who accomplished this thing. Right. And seeing that representation. And I think that's just really, really cool. Cause you can see it and go like, uh, that could be me. And so I really like the idea of sharing the stories ultimately and being like, this is the scale that it could get. Right, like you could build a business to $5 million a year, $10 million a year, and it's possible because that's the power of audiences. And that's why I love telling all this because otherwise people don't realize how far it can go. But then it's a trade-off. You know, you just don't know how people will respond. Um, I haven't really heard of examples of people having truly negative outcomes, you know, like... Yeah, the Tim Ferriss blog post is scary, but other than that... That's true. (laughs) That's true. And that is right. That is another level. That's like, that's like that's a whole five levels up from where right. I am, for example. But if you think so. about, it, I don't know how many copies of his books Tim has sold. But if we go to James Clear, for example, mm-hmm. right, he sold fifteen million copies of Atomic Habits. Um, he has, I think, the largest single author newsletter on the internet, mm-hmm. um, and that's that's pretty wild, that's pretty <laughs> you know. Cool, yeah. But but he doesn't seem to have like he st- seems to stay much more in the background. Yeah, but also like most people who have read Atomic Habits probably don't know what he looks like. Mm-hmm. So his, his like profit per unit fame is quite strong. Yeah. You know, so we host a conference every year called Craft and Commerce. And so we've had a lot of big names, you know, James has spoken at and Seth Godin. And um, one year we had uh, Casey Neistat 
come out to speak 2018, I think, um, 2019, somewhere in there. So he was like pretty close to the peak of his like vlog mm. popularity and, and all that, like, putting out a ton of content it was before he kind of like switched up his, uh, his stuff and took a little bit of a break. And so he arrived at the airport in Boise, Idaho and like someone on our team went and picked him up and all that. And even like he was starting to get mobbed, like, and the, you know, just like waiting curbside in Boise, <laughs> right? People are like, Casey, Casey, you know, like <laughs> trying to get his attention and all of that. And, uh, you know, so watching like that level of recognition him uh, getting recognized very randomly and, and, uh, that level of fame was one thing. And then, uh, the next year, Mark Manson came out to speak and this, he, uh, the subtle art with, had like sold an absurd number of copies was, you know, top five New York Times list, con uh, continually. And Mark attended the entire conference. Like not only was he at the speaker's dinner, but he and his wife were like, they went to workshops. They, they just like, Mark's a very chill guy mm. and, uh, they loved it. And then he got up and gave his closing keynote. And I think a bunch of people went, I had lunch with that guy. <laughs> That's Mark Manson. But it's the difference between YouTube where your face is on everything mm -hmm. and you have that level of fame and the book where you're like, oh, I could think that's an amazing book and I have no idea what Mark looks like. Mm -hmm. Now, what I wonder is over the last year or so, at least as I've noticed it, Mark has a lot of stuff, a lot of content that he's putting out with his face on it. And so I'm always curious. Uh, I, I wonder what thoughts you have on it of like that. Is Mark giving up something? Like he had the level of fame and name recognition. Mm -hmm that maybe so many people want without the face recognition. I don't know. Maybe he wants to get recognized on the street. Um, maybe there's another type of content that he wants to truly have his face tied to it. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I had dinner with him in, in LA a couple of months ago. Um, and he was very kind enough to offer a, a blurb for my book, which was, which, which was very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. super chill guy, really friendly. Yep. Um, it, it was interesting how, because, because I kind of said to him that like, he, he is where, I I aspire to be in terms of like the book stuff and that yeah. book still sold stupidly well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he seems to be trying to be a YouTuber and mm -hmm. succeeding fairly well at being a YouTuber. And he, and he kind of said that like, you know, with all the traditional media stuff, the Hollywood film and everything, that it's, it, it reaches more people, it's more fun and it makes more money to just make YouTube videos. Hmm. I was like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and he was kind of saying to me that like, don't peg your self-worth on like whether you hit the New York Times bestseller list or not, because you'll do it. Right. Maybe, maybe not. Like you'll change your Instagram bio and your Twitter bio and life will move on and it'll mm -hmm. just be a minor blip and you won't really care. But it's like the work is the thing. Right. Um, and so I was like, that was, it was quite reassuring. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how he feels about being recognized in public and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I don't, do you get recognized in public very often? Yeah, uh, like a few times a day if I'm roaming around London. Okay. I quite like it because that feels like a, a good level. It's educational content, so people are like, like nice about it. Yep. And like, it's only really nerds who follow my stuff. And so like, yep. chances are I'd, I'd want to talk to them about, about something. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't want it to be like in an entertainment kind of zone, right. genre. We, where there's like a line of a hundred people trying to get to you and you're yeah. like trying to be like. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think it's all, yeah, different, different genres as well. Like, who's it? Um, MKBHD, Marcus Brandley was, was talking about how he would, uh, you know, he was at this YouTuber event with like Lele Pons or someone like that. And he sort of, she, uh, she walked out of the airport and there was like a mob of like a hundred people like just waiting. He walked out of the same airport. No one recognized him. Mm. And he's got like 15 million subscribers. Is like the world's biggest tech YouTuber. Yeah. But also the, the sorts of people that walk, that watch his channel are not the sort of people that would like line up outside someone's right. hotel room to figure out, oh my God, Marquez is, is here. So I think there's... <laughs> what outfit is he wearing today? What? Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, ladders of wealth. The ladders of wealth creation, a step-by-step -step roadmap to, what's it, to building wealth. Um, yeah, so I guess the first one is... Yeah, I, you know, there's, there's these four different things. I wonder if we can just sort of talk through these in turn and just love for you to riff on these. Yeah, time. so in the ladders of wealth, I break down like four different ladders that you can climb as high as you want on any ladder, but they are, I guess, some are, some are ultimately taller than others. Um, so to run through them quickly, time for money, uh, your own services, business, productized services, and then ultimately selling products. 
And as we, as we think about skills, the skills that you have to learn are pretty different on each ladder. So time for money, you might think like, what skills do you have to learn for that? But it, you know, going back to the job at Wendy's, there's a lot of people who did not learn the time for money skills. Hmm. <laughs> Those are like being able to follow a process, doing what you're told, showing up to work on time, showing up to work sober, you know, <laughs> like yeah. some of these, these things that uh, we might take for granted, but like for a lot of people, you, you have to actually learn that to be reliable and to be consistent. And so in that ladder, you're going to start with like an hourly job. Um, you know, it could be landscaping, it could be Wendy's, it could be something else. Uh, and then later move up to a salaried job. And you're going to have a pretty big range within that, right? There's plenty of salaried jobs that would be on that ladder that could get to $200,000 a year, you know, maybe even as high as a million dollars a year that, that could be within that. Um, the next ladder I think is where things start to get more complicated, right? That's like having your own services business at the basic level. You're talking about operating as a freelancer, right? Um, and so that's where I'm just, you know, trading time for money. Both of these first two ladders are time for money. And, and there's a, a one-to-one relationship there. And, and so, but in the services business, I have to know how to form a company, right? I had to fire the, uh, file the paperwork with the government. I have to know, okay, I got to work with an accountant. I can't just use like TurboTax or some other software, right? There's some more stuff for that. Um, how, to, how to write contracts, you know, all of those things. So the first rung on that ladder is really like hourly work. Hey, I'll design your website for $50 an hour. I'll show up for this amount of time, you know, or I'll, I'll mow your lawn for $25 an hour, anything like that. The next ladder, the next rung on the ladder is when you start to charge by the project. And this is where things get interesting because now you have this big disconnect or a possible disconnect and a leverage point and you've separated time for money. Instead of I'll, I will design your site for $50 an hour, it's I'll design your site for uh, $2,000, no matter how many hours it takes. Mm. And now we've introduced leverage and you understand uh, leverage. A lot of people are like, oh, leverage is good. And I have to remind them, like, leverage is neither good nor bad. It just is. And it just amplifies what already is going to happen. Yeah. Right? So if I am investing and I borrow money, that gives me leverage to be able to invest more. That means that I'm going, you know, if the stock goes up, I'm going to make more money than I would have otherwise. And if the stock goes down, I'm going to lose more money than I would have otherwise. Sure. So in our web design example, um, maybe it takes me 10 hours and I end up making the equivalent of $200 an hour. <laughs> Maybe it takes me 50 hours and I make far less than I should have, you know. Um, so that that's the first thing. And once you disconnect time for money, then you start to get leverage. And then the last rung on that a ladder, on the uh, services ladder, is really like managing a team. And that's a whole new set of skills. And then you can get even more leverage. So at each of these two ladders, you can make a lot of money. And you need to learn one set of skills or I guess different sets of skills and you can get increasing amounts of leverage. And then really as you move across uh, to other ladders, then uh, like productized services, then it gets really interesting. I guess to, to run through them quickly, the productized services are interesting because you're, you're trying to take something that was totally flexible mm. and you're saying, let me standardize it more and more so I can move more people through the process. I can have, it's easier for team members to provide this value. Like, uh, Hey friends, for example, is a good example. What did you, the, if you explain really quick. Yeah. So Hey friends is, is an agency that we're building, um, with, with a couple of partners. Basically it's, if, if people sign up and they pay large amounts of money, like mm -hmm. I think starting at $14,000 a month, then, uh, the agency will do all of the work to mm -hmm. make them banger YouTube videos that kind of look like mine, i.e. they're talking to a camera, talking head educational videos where all like, for example, Nathan, if you wanted to do YouTube through Hey Friends, yeah. all you would have to do is show up and talk to a camera for like a handful of videos. We would do the titles, the thumbnails, the ideation. We right. would say, Nathan, we've analyzed all your work. We figured out your style. We figured out your goals. These are the videos we want you to film. You would just record to a camera, send us the files, and then our team would do all of the work in turning them into sick videos with great mm -hmm. editing and good vibes and deal with all the analytics and everything. And so that is a productized service in that we have basically converted my process for making videos into a standardized playbook yep. that team members can follow. We'll plug in your goals and your brand aesthetic and everything into that. 
and then we can then sell it out at a discount compared to what it would be to create that completely from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. So it's no longer perfectly bespoke, but in, in a lot of ways it benefits from the fact that it's not because you're, you're t- being able to take the wins that you have across clients and, and things you learn in the process and, and, and go from there. So what's interesting about productized services is that you usually go from selling them uh one-to-one, right? Like I'm not taking you out to coffee and then saying like, Oh, here's all we can do. And, like that is one skill set that you need to learn in a services business. But as you could productize, it's like, oh, now I need to disconnect the sales. I need to be able to sell through a sales page. And so for that, I, I have to learn copywriting and design and maybe WordPress or convert landing pages or whatever else to build up, like to make that sale without my time. Mm. And then on the, the services as- aspect of it, we're trying to standardize as much as possible there so we have as much leverage. So in each case, we're like, it goes from very connected and then we're just gradually trying to disconnect, okay, how the service is delivered, how it's sold, and we're getting further and further apart. Because in each case, that allows uh, for more leverage. Yeah. And then as you take that further, right? Um, hey, friends is a is a recurring offering, right? And that, oh, that's another point of leverage because wait a second, I sell this one time and so long as I keep delivering value consistently, then they're going to stay on. I'm not having to make a new sale every single month. And so that's a huge thing. And then, then the final ladder is really where you're going to, to pure products. And so that could be something as simple as an ebook, like we've talked about. Uh, it could be like a WordPress plugin. Uh, even at like a, a, an Airbnb mm. is, a, is a product that you've made, right? It's disconnected. Um, and so like WordPress, Shopify, uh, Airbnb, all of that are products inserted into an existing marketplace, right? Like I own several Airbnbs. And I don't think about how do I market them. Mm. I think about how do I make my listing good, and then Airbnb takes care of all that deal flow. So that's an easier product to make than a product where you have to like create and package and sell and then continually market and have your own, um, uh, you know, continual sales to, yeah. to scale that up. So that that you know things get harder and harder on the ladder, and then ultimately, I think that um, uh, software as a service is one of the most difficult things. Uh, to do, but also one of the highest value because when it gets implemented into a company, it sticks around for a very, very long time. And then, you know, you see them get ridiculous multiples and all that. And then ultimately, I think the hardest thing to build and the highest possible leverage is like a marketplace or a social network. Mm. Where And what's funny is a bunch of people start there, right? They're like, I have this idea for, you know, a dog walking service and blah, blah, blah. You know, and you're like that, that's a two-sided marketplace. And so you have the skills that you should be operating like on ladder one, <laughs> rung one, and you're saying like, let me dive all the way in and try to tackle the, like the absolute top of the last ladder. Mm. And that's why uh, people really struggle because they they try to bite off way too much. And they they try to make a leap that requires learning, you know, 50 skills instead of yeah. iterating through one skill at a time. Yeah, I... When I when I first read your read, read this essay, I I, th- I thought it mapped quite well onto what I was doing with my life. Mm-hmm. So like I started off trading time for money when I was like twelve and doing like private tutoring for like four pounds, five pounds an hour. Yep. Um, then I moved into selling services, which was like web design services, where I was charging by the hour. Um, and then moved into charging by the project and didn't yep. really make very much money from it. Then slowly started dabbling with the product thing. So my first proper business that, that was successful was a uh, sort of med school admissions business where I was doing selling in-person courses, teaching people how to get into med school. And initially I was doing them all myself, but then we sort of turned it into like a, a, a process that like I could hire people to follow. And then I built a sort of software medical school question bank because I knew how to code and com- combine forces with my brother. And then that was a product with some level of recurring revenue. And then the YouTube channel came and the courses on the, on top of that. And so now it's like, Almost everything we do, we try and do in the products camp. Um, and I don't like going back into productized service. Mm. It's like, hey, friends was nice because we didn't have to do anything for it. So it, to us, it was like basically a product. Mm-hmm. But the team is managing managing everything. And we do have a bit of a service-based offering for our YouTuber Accelerator, which is a little bit servicey, but that's more like a product, but just like good customer, customer service. And so now it's just like having gone through the the three different ladders and onto ladder four it's like that is where the true gains are to be had 
Um, yeah. Yeah, depending on the goal. Like, I actually was fairly against uh, services as like an ideal business. Mm. But I think the more that I've gotten into that world and paid attention to it, there are some very, very, like, truly fantastic services businesses uh, at both crazy scale and uh, much smaller. Like, I always thought it hit some limit. Yeah. Um, but after seeing, like, behind the scenes of some of these services businesses that are doing, like, 10 to 20 million a year in profit, Ooh. then you're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So what's really interesting about that is a lot of products, you end up with a low average revenue per user. So if we take your um, like productivity consumer app, yeah, right? if we will be a low average revenue per user, yeah, yeah. So you might be making a hundred dollars per year per user, yeah, something like that, right? That's very different than if we're charging ten thousand dollars a month for um, an agency service, right? That's a hundred thousand dollars per revenue, uh, average revenue per user, and so it takes really a lot of individual app subscriptions <laughs> to add up to, you know, even a handful of the agency mm. subscriptions. And so it really depends on your goals, right? If you're trying to maximize enterprise value, basically the, the equity value of what you could sell this for, then you might really focus on the app side. But if you're trying to maximize, you know, cash flow, both short and long term, then the agency could be a much better model. Mm. And then especially realizing um, that they're not mutually exclusive. This is something that Sahil Bloom is very good at, right? Where he's saying, oh, I'm going to start this and this and this. And he asks the question, like, what would have to be true for me to be able to run multiple agencies without that being a huge drain on my time, right? Like for him, protecting his writing time is the most important thing uh, in his business. And so he's like, great, I just can't run any of the agencies, right? And he and I have an agency together um, called Paperboy, which is a newsletter growth agency. And we collectively like he and I each spend maybe an hour or two a month on it because you know we hired a CEO and so when we mapped it out from the beginning it was like okay well it has to be true for us to focus on our core thing have it feed into it um mm. and then still provide this really valuable service and so it's all just all on how you design it one thing that you've been uh writing and I guess thinking about a lot recently is um the billion dollar creator and I think that relates to the idea of sort of flywheels when it comes to creator stuff. I wonder what 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 is all this stuff? Yeah, <laughs> so the, the idea behind the billion dollar creator, which is another one of these essays that I wrote, is if you have attention, which creators are so good at getting attention, like you get to point it somewhere. And so what's the highest ROI place that you would point that attention? A simple example, you know, most creators are saying, okay, let me sell an ebook, let me sell a course. Uh, affiliate products, and we're blown away, right? That you can make a thousand dollars, ten thousand, hundred thousand, a million dollars off of an audience, and like this is amazing and mind blowing. But as people who are always trying to push the limits and know what's possible, we're like, what? What else could we do? And what I wonder is, could you build a hundred million dollar business? So an example that I love is this guy Mark Sisson, who he created a blog uh, called Mark's Daily Apple, uh, maybe two thousand nine, two thousand ten uh, time period. And if you think about when the paleo diet um, started to really become popular, they, they were focused on uh, recipes and content in that niche. And he built this blog to the point that I think he was making over a million dollars a year, which is just absolutely incredible. And you might think like, okay, that's the pinnacle of what you can do with a blog. And what Mark ended up doing is he said, what else can I offer to this community? And so we thought, like, wouldn't it be really nice if you could have a, um, like, a mayonnaise or a ketchup or the things that match the paleo diet? And so he started his own company making that called Primal Kitchen. And, you know, got his recipes, manufactured, uh, all of that, and used his audience, you know, of a couple hundred thousand people on an email newsletter in this niche to, like, drive his first sales. And then as it went from there, he was trying to get distribution in grocery stores. And I don't know the exact details, but I imagine what happened is things like, like getting in Whole Foods for the very first time. They're like, um, sure, we'll see if people buy this. We'll like give you one bit of placement in this one store in Austin, right? Well, what he does is you just go into <laughs> your heat mill tool. So like, okay, let's target everyone who lives within 50 miles of that store. And then you're like, why don't you go buy uh, this? You know, hey, or like great news. Primal Kitchen products are now in this Whole Foods location. Go buy it in person. 
right? And then a week later, you talk to your Whole Foods rep and you're like, so, uh, you know, how'd that little test do? You put it in like a couple stores, how'd that go? And they're like, it went incredible. Like people, it sold out instantly. Really? Oh, that's <laughs> that's fascinating. I love that uh, the product is resonating, <laughs> you know? And it's like, well, no, you used your audience to kickstart that. So they can spread through our, they get more distribution and expand from there. Um, using the power of audience. The short version of the story is in two years, uh, they sold Primal Kitchen to Kraft Foods for $150 million. My God. And so when you think about, okay, if you have all of these people who are like close for, or like big fans of a topic, you can direct that attention to affiliate products, courses, ebooks, that kind of thing. Or in the case of Mark, Mark says, and that he's like, no, I'm going to create a consumer product that a massive scale and it's like okay a blog can be worth you know hundreds of millions um uh, emily weiss created this this blog called into the gloss about fashion right and so that was a topic that she cared about and like okay a fashion blog what could that be worth probably a decent amount but it ended up being the thing that kickstarted her company glossier oh that's her company yeah no, that that's that's her in common garden i saw it yesterday <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, right can a blog build into something worth a billion dollars? Yes, if you think about things in the right way. And so you have to focus on products that, um, you know, have built a lot of value or uh, can be sold to many, many people, or often purchased in a recurring way. Mm. Uh, if we go to the celebrity world, like if you think Ryan Reynolds, he's someone who's like, um, I'd rather not get paid 500 grand or a million bucks for a TV commercial. I'd rather buy a company like Mint Mobile or Aviation Gin and then use my marketing acumen and you know face to promote those and have all the equity value. Mm -hmm. And you know he sold Aviation Gin I think for seven or eight hundred million. Uh, Mint Mobile he sold for one point three billion to T Mobile, right? And so he's not like he's not doing basically a paid sponsorship to be on a TV commercial. He's like, nope, I'm going to do it where I get capture the full equity value. And there's example after example, and people focus on them in the celebrity world. Yeah. But it's happening nonstop in the creator world in the same way. And that's a topic that I'm absolutely obsessed with. And I guess just to give one more example, that's what I'm doing with ConvertKit, right? I can take my uh, podcast, my content, my network, all of that, and I could focus it on books and courses. And that's a great way to make 500000 or a million dollars a year. Or ultimately, I can channel all of that into building convert as a software company that's now at 40 million a year in revenue and you know uh worth a few hundred million and then like my goal that's the the premise behind the billion dollar creator my goal is to build that into a company worth a billion dollars um and it's just the same thing what's the best roi place that I can direct that attention <laughs> it's absolutely wild um the interview i did with dan uh dan Priestley on this podcast came out a couple of days ago so i was re-listening to that he is sort of a serial entrepreneur here okay. in the UK. He's, um, and he's also very bullish on the, he was like, he was saying to me, Ali, look, you can screw around with courses all you like, but if you, if you owned a business <laughs> that right. if you owned a business outside of your YouTube channel business mm -hmm. and directed traffic to that, or even owned a minority equity stake in a business and directed traffic to that, and that business then exit exits in one transaction, you could make the same amount of money as you would make in a lifetime of selling courses. Correct. And I was like, Oh, yeah, I know, I know that's right. But to me, it that just seems like, you know, if I if I look at someone like Sahil, it's he's he's got the background in private equity and like investment banking and all that shit. And for him, it probably seems easy to be like, oh, I guess I'll just build a business and hire an operator and stuff. To me, that's such a black box, right? Where I'm like, I don't know anyone who could do that. But I, as I'm saying that, I mean, like, it wouldn't be that hard to find out. I could just, like, literally spend a day just like going through people I know and who follow me on Twitter and be like, hey. I want to do this thing. I want to hop on a call, get some advice from the people that I know, put out a message to my newsletter and be like, hey, who wants to partner up in building one of these things? Like, right. It would be very doable. I don't know why I'm not doing it. It just feels, feels scary, feels hard, feels like a black box. Don't really know. I'm very comfortable yeah. in the courses business. Well, there's a timing thing as well, mm. right? It would be very easy for someone to listen to the, what we're doing here and maybe they have, say, 50,000 subscribers on YouTube, 100,000, right? Something that, that is a very meaningful milestone and a, and a huge audience like i always someone's like oh a hundred thousand isn't big i'm like look at like the largest <laughs> football stadium yeah. like that's a hundred thousand people <laughs> you yeah. know um 
it'd be easy to look at that and go, okay, forget courses, forget all of these other things. I am going to go build the next primal kitchen. Mm. I'm going to go build um, the next mint mobile or whatever. And that would be jumping like three ladders, attempting to jump three ladders simultaneously in like a single leap. Yeah. And that is a pretty sure way to, to fail. Right. And so instead what you're doing, you're iterating through all of these things, right? You have learned to build a team five years ago. I don't think you knew how to build and manage a team, nope. right? And so you got to do it in a little bit lower stakes environment. You didn't take all of your savings from the YouTube channel and say like, we're going to pour this into an app. Yep. And we spent a million dollars building out this app and it totally flopped because we did, I didn't know how to build and manage a team, right? And so a part of the Ladders of Wealth Creation article is to think about the skills that you need in order to do this and and deliberately chunk away at them, right? And so... That's the thing. It'd be, I, I think it'd be totally fine to say like, oh, I am not ready for this. Mm. I want to get ready for, for it. So maybe the, like building Hey Friends as an agency is one of the, is a key building block for you in those skills because you're like, wait, this would be the first time that I have a business that's making substantial cash flow and requires very little time for me. That's something for um, Paperboy, and my agency with Sahil and then Shane, our CEO, that was really weird to me. So I showed up to a call about like the next steps. We'd, we'd launched it, we'd done a bunch of things, and I showed up to an update call. We talked through it, we helped Shane with some key decisions he was trying to make, and then I left. And what was really weird to me is that I did not have a single to-do item coming out of that call. Whereas with ConvertKit, I am like deeply embedded in all these things. And I realized like, oh, I've like put myself in this too much and it's holding things back. So a key learning for me is like, wait, I can have a successful business that I don't spend meaningful time on. Hmm. And I'm still kind of sitting with that because that was just like a, a month ago. Yeah. And you're like, wait, so, so going to a journaling prompt, right? How could ConvertKit be more successful if I spent less time on it mm. and you're like, it cool. couldn't like my time is wildly valuable. All of this, I have a huge impact everywhere I go, whatever we want to say about ourselves. <laughs> but then I think about it, I'm like, okay, well I could empower my team more. I could make the vision more clear. I could step out of the weeds, you know, like there's so many things in that. Um, and so I think these are just skills that we build and develop over time. And so I think in your case, it might be totally fine to say like, Oh, I am not ready for this level. Mm. Because there's either skills that I want to continue to build or a certain level of comfort. Yeah. And then make a roadmap. What would have to be true for you to feel ready at that point? What small steps could you make? Is there a business that you could come in and say, like, hey, I'd love to buy 10% of your business for 100 grand. And uh, then I will also actively promote it and get a rev share from it. Right. Like there might be something that, that you could push on that level and you could try it out and then end up with this portfolio business so like how could you ease in rather than take a big leap that's a really good point yeah at the moment i'm think i, I think i think i'm thinking of it as all or nothing mm -hmm. but actually just as you were saying that i was thinking instead of thinking of hey friends as a, oh i don't need to do anything that's a great learning opportunity mm -hmm. i could just actually take more of an interest in like oh, okay i wonder how this is actually working like what's going on here right treat that as a bit of a learning learning thing um yeah it's like yeah. talking to um hunter who's the the ceo of like that whole company like, how does he build teams? Yeah. How would he, you know, what what traits are you seeing? Mm -hmm. um, if you were to look for another operator for an entirely different business, what could you learn from watching him? Mm. Um, all of those things are, are really, really interesting. Mm. How do flywheels fit into this whole oh, thing? Flywheels are, are probably like my biggest obsession right now. Um, so do you think your audience knows what a flywheel is? Should we explain uh, it? Let's define it. Yeah. Let's define not? it. Yeah. So... I first encountered a flywheel in ooh, 2008. I was in Lesotho, which is a little country. Oh, no way. That's where I used to live. Really? Yeah, I lived there for like six years growing up. <laughs> in, okay. Yeah. In, where? In, in Maseru. Okay. So I was in Maseru. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very random. Yeah. Um, most people were like, what? Where, what, what, where, where is that? <laughs> where is yeah. that? And they're like, oh, that's that country inside South Africa. Yeah. Um, so we have family friends who uh, lived around um, South Africa and Lesotho, and and uh, so we got to do a trip with them uh, and go visit and and did some work at this orphanage um, 
and we put in it like had a well drilled and then we were installing you know we need some kind of pump on top of it and at the time in 2008 the uh like electricity wasn't super consistent and so they didn't want to put an electric pump in there they wanted a hand operated pump which if you think about from a you know like at least near where i live you'd go to a campground there'd be like this hand pump that you know is is a pretty works fine for camping for the weekend you would not want like 100 kids <laughs> being relying on that for for water so instead we install a flywheel which is this big metal wheel that sits on top and instead of having this like up and down linear action that a pump has it has a rotating action and so it, it moves it turns continuously yeah. and so once we got it all set up um like it was really hard to move at first. Like my friend Luke and I both like were on each side of it on the handles, like turning it. And it's very difficult to get going. And then what we did, like over time, it starts to speed up and gain momentum and it gets easier. And what that allowed us to do is like, then he steps away and he's no longer turning it. And I can turn it by myself and then I can turn it with one hand. And then, you know, by the end, I keep the momentum going with one finger because this continuous thing and the, the metal wheel, like the inertia of that carries forward. And so when you think about it from a business perspective, most things that we do are the hand pump version. There's a direct correlation to how much effort we put in and how much results that we get out, right? Every pump down, there's a spurt of water. Mm. And flywheels are fascinating because they almost sound too good to be true. Like I've defined it as three laws for a flywheel. The first thing is that every action flows smoothly into the next right? It's this, it finishes in a loop. The second is that, uh, it should get easier with every rotation, right? Every time you turn it, it gets easier. And the third thing is every time, every rotation, it actually produces more. And in an abstract business sense, you're like, this is too good to be true. You're mm -hmm. saying this gets easier with time and produces more. That's yeah. insane, but it actually works in real life physics. Right. And I, I know firsthand of how hard that was to turn at first and how little water I got. And then by the end, I'm just standing there spinning it one hand. It's so easy. So I'm now absolutely obsessed with, uh, with flywheels of how can I apply this all throughout my business and how can I help creators apply this? So I want to go both on a very small scale and then on a very large scale. Let's take, for example, writing a newsletter every week. On one hand, it's not that hard. On the other hand, you're like, shoot, what do I even write about? And if you're working through a list of ideas or or it's scattered, then you're like, you're trying to figure, it's Monday night, the newsletter goes out Tuesday morning, you're like, what should I even write about? I'm running out of ideas. If you have a flywheel around content ideas, then it can completely change the game. So let's say that if we map out this flywheel, new people are signing up for my newsletter. Yep. And I send them a few welcome emails. And like in the third or fourth welcome email, I ask them a question. And I say, hey, what is your biggest frustration with learning to scale your YouTube channel? All right, that's what we're teaching on this newsletter. Then hit reply and let me know. People hit reply and they say, oh, I'm really struggling with how to make thumbnails. I'm really struggling with uh, like building out my content calendar, you know, whatever it is. All of those replies, you put into a label in Gmail or use Zapier to put into something else. And now when you're saying, okay, what should I write about this week? You just go into those replies and say, oh, John is struggling with thumbnails. Let me write an answer to his question and then make it a little more generic so it fits for everybody and not send it out to the newsletter. And so the way this works in a flywheel is people come in, but so basically the more people who come in, the more frustrations I collect, which gives me more ideas for content, which as I publish that content, reaches more subscribers, which gives me more frustrations, which gives me more ideas, content, and on and on. So this is a continuous loop. It gets easier with time because we're getting more and more of these questions. Uh, and then it also produces more because then later each piece of content is going to reach even more people. So early content might have gotten five newsletter subscribers and down the road, the content might get 500 new sure. newsletter subscribers. So that's an idea of taking something core in your process and turning into a flywheel that's now just running for you with some really basic automation. If you think about on the other end, we talked about Sawhill. Uh, he is really interesting to me because he's grown a newsletter 
to 500,000 subscribers in three years, mm. two and a half years, like very, very quickly. And actually, I think he's only just over a year from 100,000 to 500,000. And it's all because of this flywheel that he's built out. And so the way that this flywheel works is he has new subscribers coming in from social. So, you know, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn primarily. As they come in, he is um, selling sponsorships in his newsletter. So actually ConvertKit has a whole advertising division. So we sell the sponsorships in his newsletter. Um, he's got emails, like automated emails, welcoming people to his newsletter, sharing his work, um, all of that kind of thing. And then he's taking the money that he makes from his sponsorship and spending it on uh, paid acquisition through uh, another company that we bought called Sparkloop, mm. which has his recommendations network. And then that gets his, it grows his newsletter. So in the simplest form, the more subscribers he has, the more money he makes on sponsorships, which means he invests more money in paid growth to make his newsletter bigger, which means he's making more, more money on sponsorships, which means he has more money to invest, yeah. and so on. And it's it's pretty basic, but like an early rotation of this flywheel would get him uh, maybe ten thousand dollars in sponsorships for the month, mm. and um, you know, and then he, he reinvests that ten thousand, uh, and that might get him five thousand new subscribers. But now. Uh, he's making 50 to 70,000 a month in sponsorships Bloody hell. and reinvesting that yeah. and growing even faster. So you just watch like the snowball rolling down the hill, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and it's like getting easier with time. It's producing more and more results. Uh, and he's well on track to hit a million subscribers, you know, in the next five, six months. Mm. Uh, based on that, which is crazy to think. It's mental, yeah. He's now adding like 100,000 email subscribers a month. Yeah. Um, and it's all because he's got this aspect of his flywheel absolutely dialed in. Mm -hmm. And then there's, you know, there's things with it of like other creators he partners with and more and more that goes into it. But it, basically trying to take all these one-off tasks that you do uh, and turn them into a process that can either run automatically um, or, you know, be operated by your team or something that you can run uh, in a pretty straightforward way. Mm. So I'm obsessed with flywheels. That's the point. <laughs> That's good stuff. And you're like, hey, I, I see the diagrams, writing, newsletter, it's yeah. all. It's yeah, all I'm just thinking together. like, everything is down, fundamentally downstream of writing. Mm -hmm. And all commercial activities are fundamentally downstream of the newsletter. I think. Yeah, and one thing that I've done is, I love the design tool Figma. Mm. And so it has this infinite canvas. Mm. Um, and so I like to map out my flywheels in that. I'm like, okay, what about this? And I'll, I'll design the same thing in a bunch of different ways. Mm. And because I like playing with hypotheticals of mm. um, like figuring out what's the one driver of this flywheel? Yeah. What's the thing that makes the biggest impact? And then what if I had this other thing that was the biggest driver? Mm. And so you can really just play with like sketching this out or I, I have all these components that I use in Figma to like move it around and and uh, just think about how could I how could I tweak this flywheel? Mm. And it forces you to really simplify things about your business that otherwise you just wouldn't. So anyway, like the sketch that you started to make there, that's exactly the kind of thing that I I'll, I'll make like dozens and dozens of flywheel mm. sketches. Oh man, I've got like, to show you my fig jam. I, I, I do the same thing. Okay. Like on a Sunday, I'll go to a coffee shop for four hours and just literally draw boxes on fig jam. Yeah. <laughs> just be like, how do I simplify our business to only three metrics? What are the three that are really? And this is like, Pfft. yeah. And then it'll it'll be really simple. It'll be like, okay, well, views equals newsletter subs equals revenue. I'm like, why was that complicated? <laughs> yeah. And so then you have to close that loop. Yeah. Right. If you want to make it a flywheel, is to go. How does more revenue drive more views? Uh, more revenue drives more profit. Profit gets reinvested into business. Right, and because, then you get specific, yeah. right? Okay, that profit, yeah. how exactly does it Ooh, get reinvested? Okay, yeah, that's what I haven't done yet because I've just been like, oh, generally. But how it would do is like, if we can increase our output, that was that's one option. But mm -hmm. a completely op an option I've not even considered is the subtle paid acquisition model Yep. where actually putting money in gets you more, more views and stuff. Putting ad spend behind our videos that we know will convert to things. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and... and like in a very simple way, if you looked at like Mr. Beast's flywheel, he's just like, great, how much money did I make? How much can I pour this into making a ridiculous video that's going to get more attention, right? Mm. And and that that uh, compounded pretty quickly. And so then 
Yeah, what nice. I like to do is get to the point in the flywheel where it's obvious. Like first figure out how to close the loop. Because mm. most people get to a linear process. Mm. Yeah. Right? So closing the loop is really, really important. And then force yourself to come up with four or five different ways to close the loop. Right? Um, I had a very brief stint uh, going to college and I was in art school. Mm. And I didn't have a lot of good takeaways. But one thing that they would force you to do is when you're um, planning out your art in the early stages, do something called thumbnailing. And they just said, take a piece of paper, like fold it up a bunch and then unfo like, unfold it. So you have like, you know, 12 boxes or something of, of a small size and like sketch out a, a particular like uh, composition for your landscape. Or I used it a ton in designing apps later on. I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, at the small size, what are 10 different ways that I could design this app interface? Yep. And so I'd apply the same concept to flywheel flywheels where I'd say, okay, what if I... What if money and reinvesting profits, what if I'm not allowed to use that mm. as the loop closer or the engine of this flywheel? What else could I use? And that'll get me thinking through, like, okay, maybe it's relationships. Maybe the, mm. like, going on podcasts or something else, you know, like partner webinars, maybe that turns into the thing. Um, and so I, I like to put in the, these things, and the classics would be, what if I'm not allowed to reinvest any money in my business? Mm -hmm. What if I have to reinvest every dollar that I make in my business? What if and you, you play with those constraints and you get to things that, you know, you might get all the way back to the exact same thing that you drew, that you drew out in the first place, but you'll be way more confident in it. Or you might get to something entirely different. Sick. All right. That's some homework for me. So <laughs> A, I'm committing, officially committing to doing a thousand words a day. <laughs> um, so I'll message you and let you know how that goes. <laughs> Sounds Although, good. Mate, that'll be so good. If you're like, just thinking a thousand words a day, that's email newsletter. It's like, I never struggle with like, oh, you know, it's Sunday today, so I need to send my newsletter today and I don't have anything written. Right. We need, need to write something today, so that'll be a good start. But also things like Instagram captions and stuff. Mm -hmm. I always feel like I have thoughts, but like, I can't share those thoughts because they're either in the newsletter or they're compiled into like a sort of full-on YouTube video production type thing. But actually, if I just had the stuff written, I just have things that I'd like to share and just chucking them as an Instagram caption or as a Twitter right. long form post or something. And then alongside also making progress on these like four different book ideas. And all of it would just happen by default if I actually wrote a thousand words a day. Mental. Yep. Mental. Simple, not easy. Simple, not easy. All right. We got this. Nathan, thank you so much. Um, for anyone who's listened to the last two and a half hours of this conversation, who vibe with <laughs> your way of seeing the world, any final parting words of advice for anyone who's gotten this far in the pod? Oh man, I think uh, create every day is probably the biggest thing. Like if you embody that and you keep learning continually, like make something, put it out in the world and try to learn from how it's, you know, everything that happened there. Uh, that's the single biggest thing. And then everything else is is strategy downstream from from those habits. So don't overcomplicate it. Like we can figure out all of the crazy advanced flywheels on how exactly we're making the highest ROI from a single unit of attention yeah. later on. But you got to make sure that you have the creation dialed in. Brilliant. Uh, where can people learn more about you and your work if they would like to find out more? Yeah, let's see. Uh, if you go to nathanberry.com, that's all of my essays and, and all of that. Uh, I'm starting a new podcast called Billion Dollar Creator. Uh, so get to nerd out on all, you know, things like flywheels and equity and everything else. And then, uh, anyone who's not using ConvertKit should, it's just at ConvertKit.com. We power all the biggest newsletters on the internet. Yeah. Including ours, which is not very big, but well, actually yeah, it's, it's, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. About 500,000 subs in, in total. That's, that um, is a very large newsletter. Nice. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Um, and I realized that like you're actually most famous for ConvertKit and we spent basically zero time talking about ConvertKit. That so totally okay. it'd be great to do a round two at some point <laughs> and going charting the 10 year history of ConvertKit and the lessons you've learned along the way. That would be awesome for round two. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.